Hey, everybody. Welcome to Tone Talk. This is Mark Uzanski and Dave Friedman. And uh, tonight's guest is legendary pickup manufacturer Seymour Duncan. Seymour, how are you tonight? Oh, I'm doing great, guys. It's uh, great to be here. I appreciate it. And, uh, and I appreciate all the fans and friends and uh, buddies I've had over the years, you know, and cousins that are watching and all this stuff. So it's, it's really cool, you know, and uh, it, being in the music business for me it has been really pretty amazing over the years. I never expected to be doing what I'm doing now, you know, just being a little kid. And the, the fun part is um, I had an uncle, his name was Bid Furness, and uh, he played for Paul Whiteman's orchestra off and on back in the Philadelphia area. And uh, so he introduced me to Les Paul. So Les Paul was the one who actually showed me how a pickup worked and everything when I was like 13 years old. So I was, I was pretty fortunate to have met him back then. Wow. I didn't really, I didn't know that. Did you know that, Dave? No, that's a good story. Yeah. Right. That's an uh, awesome oh, story. Start off right from the yeah. back. Really? Les Paul, man. I met Les Paul actually um, uh, back in, in New York at the Iridium Club. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Boy, yeah. I actually played with him there. With, Did um, you? Yeah. And uh, it was, you know, I've known him so long, and um, I was very honored when he asked me to get up and play with him. We we did a neat blues thing, so it was, for me it was pretty cool, you know, to get up and and uh, to do it. But yeah, you know, and when I first met him, he was telling me about the uh, his guitar. I was asking him all these questions about it and everything, and I said, "What's this little box on the back of your tailpiece, you know, of your guitar?" And uh, he said, "Son, that's called a pulverizer." And I said, "Mr. Paul, what does it do?" And he started showing me how he would play a rhythm part. He would go chunk, 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 chunk. Then he would hit a button. This machine, he had an Ampex tape recorder in the back room, and the tape would uh, rewind. Then he would switch a little button again on his guitar, and he would play another, he would overdub another track on it and everything. So he would do diddle it, diddle it, diddle it, diddle it, diddle it, diddle it, diddle it. And then that would, he would rewind that, and then he would do just did a little, 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 and uh, so he showed me how that worked, you know, and it was called the pulverizer. And uh, so it was a really neat mechanism he had on his tape recorder he had in the back of the stage, you know. And I said, you know, I hear how you're doing the, the harmony guitar parts and everything, but how is Mary able to uh, sing, you know, two part? And she said, he said, look behind the stage here. See that lady? That's Mary's sister. And she would actually sing harmony with Mary when they were doing like how high the moon and everything. And, uh, right. Oh, wow. and uh, so I saw that and I was just like fascinated by it, you know? And uh, so I went home, I took, I uh, had an old uh, record player. I took it apart. I took the needle off of it and put it on a piece of wood to see how it would sound, you know, on an acoustic guitar that my dad had. So for me, it was really, really pretty cool, you know? And how old were you at that point? I was about 13 years old. Yeah, 12, 13. And then the funny story is uh, growing up, you know, I was, I was so fascinated by uh, the guitar and everything. And I kept back in South New Jersey, the Sears uh, catalog that we would get like every year, Christmas time. And uh, I saw this guitar in it. I said, man, I kept drawing pictures of it and everything. And, and at the time, I was 12 years old. Okay. So I right. said, you know, I really, you know, want to get a guitar it's so bad. So I left pictures around. And my mom at the time knew the drugstore owner around the corner. And and uh, he said, oh, he's watching a Lawrence Welsh show huh? all the time. So came Christmas time. I saw this box and I said, can I open it? And uh, they said, no, you got to wait. Open the neckties and the socks from, you know, Aunt Helen and, and all this and everything. So I finally opened a box. And I opened it, and I looked. I was, like, in shock. They bought me an accordion because they <laughs> thought, because I watched the Lawrence Welsh show, I wanted to play accordion, you know. <laughs> and, and, and it was it was because of uh, Neil LeVang and Buddy Merrill, you know, who were on the show, these two great guitar players. And they were, the, like, the first guys I, I actually saw play guitar, you know, on a live TV show. And then it was, you know, uh, James Burton playing with a uh, you know, Ozzy and Harriet show with Ricky Nelson, you know, like Traveling Man and, and Hello, Mary Lou. And uh, to me, seeing that, hearing that, I just said, man, that, that's what I want to do. So, I, you know, uh, and James was playing a Telecaster and I would see Neil LeVang playing this Telecaster. 
so that's the kind of guitar that I think I've always played. And luckily, in South Jersey, when I was growing up, I met um, uh, this club owner, and he said, "Oh, son, you're too too young to come in the club, you know." And, and so my cousin um, Jeannie Jean Burt at the time, she took me to the club. She worked at this diner called Ponzio's in uh, near Camden, New Jersey. And uh, so they took me to this club, and it was this band called Bob Moore and the Temps, the Temptations. Mm. And Bob Moore, when I got there, I saw this guitar player, and it was Roy Buchanan. And oh. I was like, I was like totally blown away, you know. And they, they, because I was so young, I was like 14 years old. They put me under the uh, the the bar, and there was a bunch of like little uh, wooden coke boxes, you know, that the Coca Colas would come in, and they would sit me on those. And then I, I was like two feet from the stage watching these guys, you know, it was so cool. And then Ruby Cannon, when he would start playing, he would start playing harmonics, and everybody was trying to figure out how he did that harmonics, those high squeals and everything. So he would turn. And every I could I could look through the crack in the uh, in the bar that everybody's head would be turning and Roy would keep turning more so all these heads were trying to see what he was doing you know and I thought it was it was funny it was great you know and uh, so uh, he used like an old Bogan PA system for the amplifier and he used a uh, uh, he had a, a board that had like twenty like little four inch speakers on it but he got these trumpet sounds and everything out of it you know so. That, that was really one of my big influences, you know, growing up. So I was pretty fortunate to have him. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. awesome. Great stories right off the bat, Seymour. Oh, just fun <laughs> stuff, you know. That's awesome. Love Dave, you, how, are you, how are you doing tonight? Yeah. Uh, I'm fine. This is fun already. <laughs> yeah, it's like diving in. We already have 123 viewers. Uh, and oh, yeah. lots of lots of people in the chat, so um, it's already off to a rock and start, Seymour. Um, Great, buddy, that's cool. I'm curious if you could tell us how did how, you know from the beginning of when you started with the pickups, and then uh, you know as you've been progressing as you got older, how did you start the actual you know your own company, and how, how did that come about? Well, um, I was. I used to wind slot cars all the time. So winding the little motors and everything and, and being able to control uh, the winding and everything on these little transformer coils and everything. So, so that was sort of the start of it. And then a uh, part-time hobby shop, he worked for DuPonts. And then on weekends, he, he would have the ho hobby shop, shop and he would make b archery arrows for the uh, his friends. And I would paint them. I'd be the guy, like, it would, you'd have, like, four stripes on it. It'd be, like, blue, blue, green, green, or blue, green, blue, green. So everybody knew what their arrows were, you know. So I would, I would paint them. So I had to control. And you always had to keep the, <clears throat> the brush moving. So when I started winding pickups, uh, it, was, it was pretty easy for me because I knew I just had to keep things moving or else it would bundle. And then it mm. would, like, flip over and you get loops and everything. So I started doing that for years and then um, uh, doing all the winding. That's when, like in 67, 68, I was uh, working in Cincinnati for uh, Dodd Music Center back there. And I was hanging out with Adrian Ballou, who was a longtime friend of mine and a, a great jazz player. <clears throat> Cal Collins was back there. And one of my favorite all-time players I would go see all the time is uh, was Lonnie Mack, you know, was back mm. there and everything. And then I, I got one of... Um, Oh boy! When a Lonnie Max, it's old, quitting time. Busted, yeah, yeah, quitting time. Uh, Lonnie <laughs> Max flying V's, and um, I had the pickups out of it. That and the guitar, it was a black flying V, and the pickups were damaged in it. Somebody had pulled the covers off of them, and it broke the coil. So when I when I moved to England in uh, about 1971, I was. Uh, I got a job at Defender Soundhouse, uh, working for Ivor Ar Arbiter, and Ivor was the one who did the uh, fuzz face for Jimi mm -hmm. Hendrix, like his his company type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I started working with a guy in England by the name of Ron Roca. And uh, while I was over there, I had a, an old telly that I brought over from the U.S. And then that telly became the first telly gig that I did for Jeff Beck. And I had the Jeff's bridge pickup was the Lonnie Max pickup. 
And then uh, I wound that into the first JB. That was my first JB that I hand, actually hand wound over there. And then the neck pickup was, I called it the JM or the John Milner pickup. And nobody knew what, who the heck John Milner was. And John Milner was a character in American Graffiti that had the yellow high boy hot rod. And I know Jeff loved that, that movie, you know, and that, that hot rod. Hmm. And uh, so I started doing that. And then I was, I was working God, with Alexis Corner and just all these bands. Mark Boland from T-Rex, you know. Hmm. I started working on his guitars. And then Jeff used the guitar that I built him. And he, he did the Blow by Blow album with it. And he did Cause We Ended His Lovers using the first JB that I made for him for this custom modified Telecaster that I called the Telegib. And mm. uh, so that was, you know, if you remember that song, you know, he was using the yeah. volume control and he was, he sort of dedicated it to, um, to uh, Roy Buchanan. And uh, so it was, it was really neat how all this in Sweet Dreams, when Roy did that, he was like, Jeff Beck. I mean, so it was kind of neat that I was trying to introduce these guys to each other. But mm. when uh, I started, you know, doing it, I did. I was working with all kinds of bands in England. I did a. Oh man, I can't remember the name of the band. So were, uh, were you doing like pickup rewinds for them at that point? Yeah, like, yeah, just yeah. Like at the first time, their broken pickups and stuff. Say something about this pickups. Yeah, at the first time. Yeah, I was. Uh, you know, I had a custom rewind, just a rewind. That's all people were doing. I couldn't afford a mold to mm. manufacture actual bobbins or anything. And then when I started in like 1979, 80, I would route out each piece of flat work for like a Strat or a Tele pickup. And, and I would make a fixture out of four bond or a Pinelli. And then that would be my template. And then I would use a router and cut out each piece one at a time. And then I would oh, have boy. to punch all the holes in it and drill the holes out. And then uh, my engi other engineer, Kevin Beller, who's still with me since the eighties, um, we used to punch out every, every piece of flat work that we needed. And finally we uh, met, you know, we were doing a trade show and uh, with a K and D, which was Phil Kabicki and Seymour Duncan. We, I was, we were like their distributor for Phil Kabicki who did the factor base later in the years for Fender. And then, um, uh, so I started uh, just doing custom work, you know, and then we got this huge order for 200 strap pickups, you know, and I just said, oh boy, okay. So I had to, we cut out each piece, you know, and uh, then we had to wind it, wind each one all wound by hand. And uh, so that, that's basically how it started. And all of a sudden we started getting more orders and more orders and we, we, didn't, have, we didn't do OEM or original equipment manufacturing for any of the other guitar companies at the time because you know we were a small company it was it was kathy duncan and uh kathy carter duncan and uh we were once married and then but still partners and then we had kevin beller and we had other t t various employees and everything and then we started um uh, we got a distributor in japan and uh UB Sound, and then all of a sudden we started doing a lot more manufacturing, you know, and and then we started getting orders, and then we found out about a thing where they'll give you a, like a blanket PO, and then you, you can actually get money off of that from the bank, so you can go out then and buy all your uh, materials that you need to actually manufacture, you know, which was really pretty cool. So we went out, and we bought sheets of four bond and, and, and tons of magnet wire and everything. We had to get magnets custom made. So we started doing that. And then uh, we would grind all each magnet hand one by one, you know, which was so cool, you know, to do that. And Bill Carson actually came up to our factory. And Bill was one of the guys with Leah Fender who helped design the Stratocaster, you know. And uh, so we, we, we were friends from the beginning, you know, and because – when I was like 15, 16, I used to write Fender all the time. And I would ask all these questions, you know, this is like 1965, 64, 65. And then I would say, when was the first Stratocaster made? When was the first you know, Jazzmaster made? When was the first uh, Telecaster made? Uh, what's the story about the Esquire? You know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, a month later, I get this letter back and all, all my questions were answered, you know, and it was oh, signed Bill Carson. Bill Carson at the bottom of it, you know, and then years later when I first started doing my uh, NAM show, so it would have been 
oh man, 10, 10, 15 years later, I, I see him at an AM show and I said, Mr. Carson, I said, I don't know if you're going to remember, but years ago I used to write and ask you all these questions about the history of the Fender guitar. And he just like looked at me and he stared. He says, you're that guy that made me do all that homework, you know? <laughs> and I said, oh, I, I said, I apologize. He said, no, no. He says, you know, we were kind of unorganized and we didn't even know ourselves when, what our dates were for when we were manufacturing, you know, when we started making things, you know, and he says, you helped me get everything in order. And I thought that was so cool, you know, and uh, I did a eulogy for him when he passed away, which made me feel so good, you know, to be able to do that, you know, for him and everything. But uh, uh, Bill and I were friends and uh, for a long time before he passed away, you know, hmm. That's so anyway, that's, you know, that was the whole beginning of me actually manufacturing. And then we, uh, we found, uh, I met Seth Lover and Seth Lover was the guy who invented the uh, patent apply for humbucking pickup for Gibson back in right. 1955. And so we became good friends and I would spend time with him down in Garden Grove, California. And he would show me all his stuff and he was in a ham radio, which I am also. And the reason I got into ham radio was because of Joe Walsh. Joe Walsh and I used to play together back in Cincinnati. Uh, and Joe, we were talking always about ham radio. So I got into ham radio. And then when I met Seth Lover, he was into ham radio. So we just hit it off, you know, and which was really cool. And then he came to the uh, our factory and everything. And I, I had asked him about, you know, manufacturing. And he says, well, you know, here's here's where, you know, we got our stuff done, you know, and it was huge, huge plastic in uh, San Jose, Michigan. And uh, the factory's no longer around, uh, which I'm sad to say. Mm. And then, but uh, uh, we talked to them and they made our first humbucking mold. And it was the same company that did the original Gibson humbucking mold. So uh, we, we still use the same mold for all the antiquities and everything that we do. So I'm oh, pretty really? proud of, of, of cool. knowing, yeah, of knowing that. And, uh, and we got the, the the butyrate, the correct butyrate, and everything from the original manufacturer and stuff. And uh, so for me, having all that history was was so cool because of all the uh, uh, the people that you meet and everything. By the way, say hi to MJ. Oh, we Hello. Lost <laughs> we just lost you. Uh oh. They'll be back. Well, I'll say hi to the people in the chat while we're waiting. Yeah. Oh, you guys back? I'm here. Can I, yeah. Okay. I, can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I just cut out for a minute. It cut out there Technical for a Technical difficulties. Yeah, airplane yeah. went over. <laughs> Please stand by. So, uh, no, yeah. that's that's great. That's great. Yeah, I actually have a set of antiquities in my Les Paul. Oh, uh, cool, man. That's great. I, yeah. I love them. I, I love them. Yeah. Uh, they they it, sound it, great. You know, there, there's a lot of unique things about them, which is really cool, you know, and uh, I've always been into doing things, weird things, you know, always messing with magnets, messing with coils and the coil patterns, and and I actually have the original winding machine uh, that we got from an old Gibson warehouse, and then I got, uh, Seth Lever gave me his original hand winder that he wound the original uh, P90s and the original humbuckers on. So wow. stuff like that. We have a lot of historical things around here, which is so cool, you know. That's amazing. And, uh, yeah, it's fun, you know. And me, I'm, I'm a big pack rat, and I never throw anything away. And uh, and I keep all kinds of um, uh, memorabilia. I have all the uh, Seth Lever's notes that he gave me, you know. and wow. just uh, That's amazing. And, and when he passed away, his family gave me his whole garage which you can imagine what, what it was filled with and all kinds of transformers. And he had probably a thousand, uh, Bakelite radios. You know, he just, he had a huge wow. radio collection. So I gave those to various friends and everything. And then, um, it, it's, it's pretty neat. You know, when you meet other people that have stories about, you know, Seth Lover and meeting all these different people and, and, you know, the, the neatest thing, for me, over the years, I've met just about every guitar hero that that I ever grew up listening to or uh, seen on TV. And guys like Chet Atkins and Jethro Burns and just so many, so many great people. And one of my first bands I saw on the uh, 
uh, Lawrence Welsh show was the Shantays, you know, Bob Spickert and his, his group and everything. And to me, that kind of music is timeless. You know, like when I pass away, I want them to play Pipeline for me. <laughs> so it's like, it's like cool stuff. And another guy, too, is a, his name is Davey Spillane. He's a guitar player, but he's a bag, Yulian bagpipe player. And he did Riverdance. And if you ever saw that, that uh, the film Riverdance, He's the guy that did the beautiful bagpipe uh, song in the in the middle of it and everything. But mm. uh, we're longtime friends, and he lives in Ireland. And uh, so for me, it's it's really great. And then the lucky thing, you know, when I went to England in seventy about seventy two, I was working. I was I was a puppeteer for the Uncle Al show in Cincinnati, yeah. Ohio, and I worked for Al Lewis and Wanda Lewis, and I did puppeteers and all kinds of things. I was a forward director huh. and then I, I i did a show and uh and uh, i was on tv playing with nick clooney who's george clooney's father and the fun thing there is uh, uh jerry reed was playing in town and jerry saw the show and he said man he says i'm playing my guitar never showed up and uh, so i landed my telecaster and my old deluxe reverb and he used it to play and so, so then jerry and i were longtime friends of uh I guess for me helping him and everything. So, I mean, I've been so lucky to just meet so many great players and playing with Tommy Emanuel up in Canada and everything. And, uh, uh, you know, Dwayne A too. Dwayne A has been a big hero and probably my number one instrumental band is the ventures, you know, with Don Wilson and Bob Bogle, rest in peace. And, and, uh, the great, amazing Noki Edwards, you know, who, as he's just amazing. He's the encyclopedia. Him and James Burton are the encyclopedia of guitar licks. I mean, these guys, you know, I'll, I'll ask Noki, how did you do the intro to Slaughter on 10th Avenue? You know, and he'll go, din -in -din. he'll do like that diminished chord, you know, and, and he remembers all that stuff, which is pretty fantastic, you know. Mm. And uh, so, so I've been lucky, and I've always been a lover of other guitar players, you know, and working. Uh, I was recording in Philadelphia at a studio called Virtue Recording Studios. And I was playing with a rockabilly guy named Ray Coleman. And Frank Virtue was my engineer at the studio. And this guy comes in and he says, let me show you something. So he showed me, how, I had a Stratocaster, 63 Strat, and how to put my hand on the bridge and how to do the staccato muting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and his name was James Bruno, and he's the guy that did Guitar Boogie Shuffle. And if you want to hear a great song, you have to listen to Guitar Boogie Shuffle. And James Bruno's son is Jimmy Bruno, who's the great jazz player. He plays all over around Philadelphia, but all over the place. I mean, he's just a fantastic uh, player. You know, I mean, there's so many great players. And, you know, and I've done so many seminars in different towns with my different sales guys and reps and everything and uh mm -hmm. and every town you go to you, you get a backing band you know and they're just like holy mackerel man listen to these guys play and there's so many great people out there that maybe have never you know been you know on tv or recording but there's mm -hmm. so many good people and and i appreciate all those guys that are out there playing like that you know and uh oh yeah and th there's a lot and of people it's so there. cool i mean there's so many great players i mean there's so many styles and so many uh, inspirations well, I, of these other guitar players. I got a question for you. One of one of the yeah. questions I posted on Facebook um, for people to, you know, the viewers of the show to post questions for you. So I've gotten a list of questions. So I figured, why don't I jump okay. in and, and uh, ask away if you don't mind, Seymour? Um, so uh, Reza uh, Muzavi, cool. Muzavi, is that how you say it, uh, Dave? Muzavi. That's a good question. Yeah, Muzavi. <laughs> well, okay, I can't answer Let's just that. Call it All right. Uh, he wants to know if you can break down uh, the entire Hendrix story. Um, oh boy! If, or well, if you, tell us as much yeah. as you can. Or... Yeah, yeah. I'll, tell, I'll, I'll do it pretty quick. Um, back in 1968, uh, there was a, a guy by the name of Don Litwin. His father owned a jewelry store, a Litwin Jewelry, around Cincinnati area, and uh, I had been recording. Uh, I recorded with a girl named Jerry Jackson. I'm not sure if it's, she's a relative of Michael Jackson or not, but it was Gigi and the Charmaines, which was the backing group for Lonnie Mack. And they, they did all the vocals and everything for Lonnie Mack. 
so anyway, uh, this guy heard me playing and he says, oh man, he, and I was doing all this stuff in the studio and uh, he says, you know, I'm doing this show and there's somebody I want you to meet, you know, and, and I told him about you and, uh, and it was Jimi Hendrix, you know, so I got to the show in Cincinnati, it was Xavier University and uh, so they, they took me backstage with Jimmy and uh, uh, he says, you're Seymour. And I said, yeah, I'm Seymour Duncan and uh, he says, man, come, come look at my guitar. So he had a, uh, one of his strats, you know, we were messing around with. And he says, I'm, I'm doing this, getting this like sound. And I said, that's coming out, out of the nut, from the nut, from the, uh, the string, grabbing too much, you know. And, uh, and then the other technician with him was Roger Mayer, who did the Octavia for yeah. Hendrix and Jeff Beck and everything. And uh, so when I got there, I had wound uh, six uh, old strap pickups that were broken. I rewound them and to what I thought maybe he would use, he could use, you know, and I, I had him calibrated also for uh, bridge, neck and middle. And uh, I put a little bit more turns on the bridge pickup just so, you know, using a thinner string and his pickups were reversed actually on the, the he played right handed strat backwards. So the angle of the strap pickup would have been different on the, uh, the way he played it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I in in Cincinnati, I was good friends with WEBN Radio, uh, Frank and Bo Woods and Robin Woods, and uh, I used to go over to their house all the time. And they had their own radio station, which is a great re radio station in Cincinnati, WEBN. And uh, Frank Wood, who owned the station, gave me this promo record of "Are You Experienced" by Jimi Hendrix. So I had one of the, the first actual Hendrix records that you know, was put out, you know, which I, I thought was fantastic, you know. And so I took it back home with me. I just played it over and over and over again so I could hear what this guy was doing. And I was hearing backwards tapes and, and all this stuff, you know, tapes were cut and the tape was reversed, you know. And, and uh, then later years, I became friends with Eddie Kramer and we talked about all that stuff, you know, so. But luckily, when I was there with Jimmy, I, I took all these photos, which people have never even seen. And so I started uh, looking at his guitars and everything and trying to figure out what, what he was doing with it, with the uh, guitar reverse. And I measured, I have, have his old strings, I have his scars, I have, have his springs from the back of his guitar and everything. So I got all these goodies, man, which is so wow. cool, you know. And, Amazing. And uh, so it was... For me, you know, and we spent a day and a half together messing with guitar. He kicked everybody out. He didn't want to talk to anybody else. He didn't want to do interviews or anything, you know, because he, we were we were doing guitar work. And he was excited about it. He loved playing with his guitar and doing bridges and changing angles of springs and his back plate. And he showed me how he would pluck the string or the spring in the uh, cavity where the uh, spring was for the tremolo. And he would hit it. And then he would get all these different sounds, you know, then he would hit it again and, and bring it back up, you know, mm -hmm. and then he would pluck behind the nut. He would hit the back of the, the headstock and everything and the guitar would vibrate. And then he would bring the, the strings down and how the pickups were angled. He said, sometimes you got this wobble effect. And I said, it's because your, your pickups are adjusted too high. So he brought them down a little bit and then he could control that feedback. And he, he just loved it, you know? And, uh, uh, he was just, he was a real good man and he really just um, loved how guitars worked, you know, it was so neat. And then it was, for me, it was just fun being there with him, watching him talking to Roger Mayer and then Roger what? stuck the pickup. Was this in, in New the York? Guitar. No, this is uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh, in Cincinnati. Okay. Yeah. And so Roger yeah. Mayer was there too. Yeah. Cause he made yeah, the, uh, the Octavia. Yeah. Form. Octavia. Yeah. And, uh, Roger, um, you know, I think I have one of the only photos of him and Jimmy together because people never saw Roger, you know, or Jimmy. And right. there's been no photos of them together with Jimmy, you know. And uh, I was very lucky to, to get a shot of putting the pickups in Jimmy's guitar when he was testing it and everything. We were doing adjustments and all this stuff. And it, it, was, it was good. You know, it was a great time. You know, it, it, seems, it, it, it seems to me that you should do a book. A coffee table uh, book. Um, 
I know. I mean, I, I have this like neat just thing pictures, is I have thousands of photos too. The pictures yeah. and stories in a coffee table book, boy, that would be amazing. It because be. I mean, just yeah. listening to this, just hearing that, and what you have of Jimmy's and stuff. It, uh, oh man. <laughs> well, I, I always want to do like a calendar too. You know, I got like all the Jeff Beck stuff. I got, got the Roy. I got the Seth Lover stuff, and so for me. It, you know, I, I need to do something with it. I'm, I'm not no spring chicken anymore, you know, so I need to get, <laughs> yeah, you you need know, to, get all these share ideas that, out. Share that, share that with the world, that, uh, that book. I know, I know. Coffee table book, man. It's re- it'd be really important to people, I think. Yeah. Uh, just because just so. hearing this makes me makes me just go, I want that book. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the, the neat thing is, is I can tell you a story about – each thing like the scarf and everything and yeah exactly and, and we we had we had this his guitar case open he says ah take whatever you want because he had like all this stuff in it i have a slide bar and everything that, that he gave wow. me i have yeah. two broken tremolo arms you know and uh, just the pictures and, alone <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah a couple yeah. anecdotes in the and, pictures and the, the neat thing too is i have you know his strings i have uh les paul strings i have joe walsh's strings i have um Eric Clapton strings, uh, Jeff Beck mm-hmm. strings, and if someday I can get the DNA off of it, you know, yeah, so. <laughs> and, Absolutely. and make, make 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 this little little guitar guy, you know. Yeah, clone him. And, uh, clone. Yeah, hey, clone we got we got a, we got another question. Uh, that okay. was awesome. Thanks, Seymour. That was an awesome awesome story on uh, Hendrix. So, uh, from a bunch of guys, I want to give a shout out to Craig, Joe, Pete. John and Jim, because this is a question from them uh, about Hi, Eddie, Eddie Van Halen's 5150. Um, yeah. If you can confirm or deny or, you know, tell us what you know about the pickup that was in the 5150 guitar. Um, and then I have a follow up question to that. OK, uh, that's a real good question there, because um, I used to send him a, a whole bunch of different uh prototype pickups and everything that we wound and uh i had old bobbins that i actually wound so i don't know if that one ended up in that guitar but i know they brought us that guitar to clone the pickup for his the van halen uh, reissue thing that they did you know and and mj and i we had to put all the dirt on it and all the mud and we came up with all these neat ways to, to age these old uh cavities the old switches and everything mm-hmm. and so for me um it's real hard to say what uh, it was all about. Hang on. Oh, here's a set right here. If you guys is it the replica? Is the replica guitar? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. This will. Can you guys see this at all? Yeah. Yep. Yep. You can see it. I don't know where you're. Yeah, I can is. see it. Yeah. Yep. Oh, good. Okay. So you know, we can, everything we make, we we make extra. So we have our own copy here, which is so cool, you know. And, uh, and over awesome. the years, you know, you know, working with David Gilmore, you know, and and working with uh, just just so many great guitar players over the years, you know, I've been I've been very fortunate about all that, you know, working with some of these guys firsthand too, you know, and and those guys being my friends and like Peter Frampton, you know, he's coming into town pretty soon and. And uh, I did a lot of work for him, you know, and and uh, just the people. And the, the cool so, thing when I when I when I first got to England, I'm um, at a club called the Rainbow, and we're watching the Who. Okay, they're one of their farewell mm-hmm. tours, I believe. And I'm up there with Jeff Beck, so we're up on the balcony, and it's all pretty dark and everything. And this lady comes to me and stands to the left of me. She says, "Hello, are you a drummer?" Yeah, very, very cute voice and everything and uh i said no no i'm 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 a guitar guy here i i'm working at the fender sound house and i'm doing a i did that telly give for jeff beck so she says well if you can uh if you know of any drummers you know uh let us know here's our number and she gave me this piece of paper and it said linda and paul mccartney uh-huh. <laughs> i said i said you're kidding and i didn't say it, i just said it to myself i said oh my god and I look over, and there's Paul McCartney talking to Jeff Beck. And here I am, you know, my, my first, you know, month in England, and here I am meeting one of the Beatles, you know. And I wow. just thought that, to me, I was, like, fantastic, you know. And and then uh, five minutes later, this other English guitar guy comes walking up, and uh, it was Gary Moore. 
you know, and uh, so we became friends then. So for me, that was that was my day back at, at Fender. But um, working with Eddie, you know, and uh, so I was proud to do those pickups and everything, you know, and the fifty one fifties and. Well, let, let, and, let's, uh, let's let's go back a minute on that. Let, so when did you first meet him, and when did you first do something? I met him. I met him. It had to been like seventy nine. 80 maybe mm -hmm. he was playing with alan holdsworth at the roxy i think it was the roxy down in hollywood mm -hmm. and he was in there and then i met him again at a show on the uh, queen mary where zz top was playing and i was backstage with carol burnett which to me was so cool you know meeting her and we we were eating all the uh, treats that they had backstage and everything and it, it was fun we had a fun time but i met uh you know david and uh, um uh, Eddie and all the guys, and Michael Anthony is just a great player, great nice guy too. Oh, yeah, super, I mean, very, super very nice, nice guy. guy. Yeah, super nice guy. Yeah. So, and, so when did and, you first do something for Ed? It had to be, I thought it ran early '80s. It had to be early '80s, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know what he used because I would send him to his Rudy. I think was his, one of his guitar tags at the time, uh -huh. mm. and uh, so I sent stuff to him. But you, you never know. You don't know. If, the other tech guys use them somewhere else or give them to Eddie or change things out. You, you, you never know. People were so quiet about how that tone happens. And, you know, he was using the uh, oh, eliminator, whatever you call it, that thing he was using for his power, power soaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I was always sending stuff down to him, you know, so I, I don't know what, what he had. I mean, the tech guys would know if, if uh, you ever have yeah. a chance to interview him or anything. And, well, I, I have Sometimes a follow-up. They, they, they don't even know, you know. Yeah. I have a follow-up question to, the, to that, though, then, because, um, you know, and I, I know that there's several pickups that kind of can get to that sound, that uh, you know, the EVH sound. Um, and I'm curious, which which pickup is was kind of modeled after what he uses? Was it the, well, it was, it was, the 78 it was like or the custom custom? Or I'm just curious. It was like a, a 78 model, probably, because it was more like a PAF. And we have we keep all our notes and everything. And which one's this? That's Eddie, like 1978. Yeah, here's the Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, this is paper, so wrinkled. But it's wow. a uh, PAF I did for him back in 1978. So there you go. we have the we have the records here. So what was Eddie. that? 1978. Yeah, but so, so so what was that? What was that pickup? That was a rewind, was or was a, it? A... Yeah, it was it was probably a, a rewind of an old PAF and. Uh, and here's a bunch here we did. I'm not sure what, what this is, MJ. I can't see it. So, but it was in 83. 83, yeah. And that's MJ, by the way. Yeah, can you see MJ? Say hi, MJ. Hi, MJ. Hi. Hi, MJ. Hi. MJ's in charge of the custom shop here, yeah. And these are the notes for about seven pickups that we sent back in 1983. Of, I mean, more Eddie Van Halen pickups. Well, how, how, how hot were those pickups, or what was the... They, they, were, they, they, were, they weren't really high. They were like PAS, you know, because okay. I always knew... I knew that he liked PAF kind of sound, you know, and I think he got some of his earlier ones that have like an old 335 or something, you right. know, and, and then, uh, and he, you know, the, the neat thing is, is he was always experimenting too, and I thought that was great, you know, he's out there chiseling his guitar away, and he put switches in it that he didn't even do anything, the neck pickup didn't work, you know, and uh, so it's, it's always um, kind of funny to see. Here's a player now who's one of my favorite, Jim uh, uh, Campolongo. Are you familiar with him at all? Out of New York City. I think he played with, uh, uh, what's his name? But uh, he's a great telly player too. And, and he's been using our pickup for like God, 20 years now, I guess, 25 years. This pickup that I rewound for him in the custom shop. And uh, Jim Campolongo, he's, he's a great telly player. But he's in the vein of like Roy Buchanan, Danny Gatton kind of thing you know mm -hmm. players and and uh, uh and danny gatton i'm sure you guys remember him and, oh yeah, uh, yeah he was one of my yeah he was one of my uh, we were good friends and i'm really into collecting arrowheads and everything so was danny and then mm. we were up in canada and uh he was doing a show up there and he wanted me to play with him in uh, vancouver and during the day we were out out looking for arrowheads along the riverbank and everything so we come into this club and it was like you know two in the afternoon and this, this 
club owner. He says, get the hell out of here. What are you guys doing here? <laughs> and, and Danny looked at me and I looked at him and we just said, well, we're the band, you know, and the, and the guy said, we mean you're the band. You know, and I said, this is Danny Gatton, you know, and uh, so and he said, where have you guys been? Because we, we had mud up to our knees and everything. And our shoes were all like all full of mud from looking for arrowheads on the riverbank, you know, mm. and uh, so but we would always trade arrowheads and I'd make stuff for him. And, but uh, I miss him dearly, you know, as long as Roy Buchanan, too. I miss him dearly. You know, two like, amazing players. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You know, so. Yeah. Anyway, another question. Yeah. Oh, well, you got plenty. Oh, my God. Um, I can jump around. So um, thanks for telling us about uh, Ed and uh, the, with the 78. That's good. That's good to, to know. Um, so, let me fill something in on that, too, guys, you know. What what I what I know and I've been dealing with Ed for years too and 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 what Seymour's saying is essentially we sent him lots of stuff and he tried all sorts of things and he always experimented yeah. with everything and what he settled on it's unknown it's unknown to him <laughs> sometimes you know yeah yeah it's and, probably and, true and, too and, yeah exactly and and you know it, it, something that's always true is if there was a, a pot or a knob, he would always turn it up. Uh, right. Right. Just don't yeah. tell him, don't tell him about that stuff. Cause otherwise he's going to want more of it. He yeah. always wants but, but, more. Eddie, Eddie's a great player. I mean, Absolutely. from the get go, man, from the get go, yeah. he, he's always just blown me away what he does, you know, and guys like Steve, I, you know, and Joe Satriani, I mean, all these guys are just like, really unique players and everything, you know, and, and, and I, I really love it. There's a young player out of Nashville, Danny Donato. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, mm -hmm. but uh, he, he's 19, 20 years old, and he plays like early James Burton. He's spunky, man. He's just got the energy, and he plays great, you know, for – he's just so mature for his playing and everything. And then, uh, God, there, there's uh, Marcus King, you know, this young blues player, you know, from back east. I think he's – I don't know if he's Atlanta or whatever – but same way, man, he just, just has his heart and soul, you know, he's got that voice and just a great player, you know, and, and it's, for me, it's so neat seeing guys like that out there that are out there and you guys are, you players are out there too, doing it, you know, and, and just, just keep doing it, you know, um, uh, try to get people to see what you're doing and experimenting all the time. And I think that's so cool, you know, and that's why with the Seymour Duncan custom shop, you know, we've made so many different models for players, you know, and, and everybody hears something different, you know, your ears, you know, you may like one player and then another player, you know, and everybody has their own taste and of playing styles and stuff, you know, so you have to uh, appreciate what everybody's doing, you know, and, and don't, don't put somebody down if you don't like their playing style, just, just, you know, think about what you want to do and, and mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've worked with Ingve Mastin. I mean, the guy's just a phenomenal player, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, um, Joe yeah, Bonamassa, us, you know, tell us about, tell us about Ingve. Ingve, you know, we did a lot of, uh, custom work for him here at the uh, Seymour Duncan custom shop and up with Kevin Bauer and engineering voicing certain pickups. And he hears something, you know, he hears a, a tone that he wants to get out of his guitar, mm -hmm. you know, and, so everybody, so many people are like that, you know, what you like, I may not like, and what I like, you may not like, you know, and, mm -hmm. and to this day, like my favorite players are like Albert Collins. And a lot of these kids don't even know who these players are. You know, Albert Collins was just a, just a great player. You know, the way he played oh, yeah. and not using a, a pick or anything, you know, and, and, uh, you know, there's, there's so many out there, you know, and, and, and these kids are so lucky today. They got YouTube. And then oh, they can yeah. sample so many different players that are out there, which is phenomenal. I mean, I had the Lawrence Welk show and I had the Ted Mac amateur hour. That I could watch <laughs> the Ozzy and Harriet show. That was it. You yeah. Know? Three, three so, channels. Yeah. But, but I, I hear things, I hear these tones, you know, and, and so for me, it, it's very important to, um, you know, help these young kids get the tone they want. Cause they hear something, you know, it's like, all one model isn't made for everybody, you know, it isn't, you know, and, and uh, you buy maybe a Strat or Les Paul, those pickups are wound to manufacturing specs and they're pretty much all the same, but it's up to the player. The player will make the tone come out of a guitar, you know, his hands, the way he picks it, you know, and, and, uh, I worked with a guy, Bugs Henderson down in, um, uh, <clears throat> Fort Worth, Texas area. 
And he had worked with Freddie King. And Freddie King's like another great player. And you watch these guys, man. They're just, it's phenomenal, you know. It's, uh, I, I've been lucky, you know. Yeah, so. so, sounds like it, totally. I, um, I'm going to jump to another question, if you don't mind. Um, okay. Someone had a question about, uh, it was not someone, it was Doug Thacker. Thanks, Doug, for posting your question. Um, he wanted to know if you could tell us a story about Jeff Beck and Neil Gerardo, or Gerardo getting uh, each other's pickups by accident. Uh, what were the pickups? What, what happened uh, to them? That, you, that uh, Jeff Beck and Neil Gerardo got their pickups uh, swapped by accident or something like that? Oh, I don't know, but that's I. But that's probably something I I didn't even know about or hear about. You know, <laughs> <Okay>. but, uh, <laughs> who, who knows? Right. I, it, it may. I mean, it may have happened. You know, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, we we make so many pickups and so many go out, and I don't know if something got shipped wrong or no. Neil got Jeff's Sounds pickups like and Jeff got <laughs> Neil's pickups. Yeah, it could have been. I mean, accidents happen. You know. Yeah, no and, doubt. Uh, but it, they both play great. You know, and um, oh yeah, they're uh, amazing. It, it's. I mean, it's, it's so neat that everybody has their own styles, you know. And, and Tal Wick, Wakenfield, we did pickups for her for oh, her she's bases. Awesome. And, uh, she's great. Yeah. Oh, she's, she's great, man. It just blows me away, you know. And, and she'll come up here to Santa Barbara and come in her factory here and hang out and everything. And, and uh, What a great personality she has. Oh, yeah. She's kind of shy and sweet. And uh, she's the way she plays, though, it's just, just – and when, when she did the Jeff Beck stuff, you know, and oh. – uh, Phenomenal. Ronnie Scott live at Ronnie Scott's and everything. I mean, to me, that's, that's, you, you can't, it's, it's just so, you know, you can see Jeff, man. He was just, he was so happy, you know, he, Oh yeah. He was, the music, he, he was just having fun. And that's what, that's what so much what it's about and everything, you know, so that's cool. I love the Ronnie Scott but, uh, stuff. Um, so what other, yeah. what other stuff did you do with Jeff Beck? Tell us more. Oh man. Well, I did the guitar shop. I did it. Okay. I made a telly that I made for Alan uh, Dutton, who was his uh, road, like road manager, would go on road with him all the time. And uh, so, you know, he wanted me to make a, a guitar for him. So I made a guitar for him. And then Jeff heard it and he said, no, this is my guitar. So he <laughs> took it from his, he was roadie, you know, which I felt bad for Alan, but uh, I got him, I made him another guitar and everything. But it was just a, a Frankenstein guitar but what I did kind of unique in it is uh, the bridge pickup. I tapped it and then I reverse wound the neck pickup. And then when I would go into the two and four position, it was humbucking in both positions that in the number one position, it was a full output of the uh, bridge pickup in the second position. It was a full output and the neck pickup. Then in the third position, which was the center was the neck pickup by itself. And then in the fourth position, it was the first tap and then the neck pickup humbucking. And then the number five position was the bridge pickup first tap. So it was brighter and more traditional, like James Burton kind of sounding. But he used that guitar on Guitar Shop. And if you listen to the first song, Guitar Shop, you can really hear because he, he's always manipulating the switch and everything on that, you know. And uh, uh, so that was one of the guitars I did for him. I, I made him... Uh, got on for that and then uh when he did uh, ambitious the record ambitious uh, that was the uh, grover jackson guitar and the jackson and it had the uh that's the one that tina um oh, what's her name tina turner tina tina turner signed yeah and she and carved it with, it with like ice a pick? fingernail file <laughs> ice pick or fingernail file i think it was you know yeah. But those had Alnico 2 Pro pickups in it. So that was used in the Ambitious video, which you can still see on YouTube, which is really neat because it has all these celebrity actors and singers and everything. And uh, uh, it was it was great. Guys from Wet, Wet Willie and everything. And, and uh, it, it was it was fun. We did it at AM Studio, A&M Studios in Hollywood. And um, but that you can find it. And, these kids should go, you know, find, for me, it's like, a, you know, you go out, I, I look at this stuff and I, I just laugh and remember doing it and everything. And it was a lot of fun. But over the years, I've done so many things for Jeff. When he did, um, oh, that basketball movie um, uh, with uh, Jed Lieber, they recorded it at the Marquee Studios, at the Marquee uh, nightclub or hotel in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
Oh, I forget the uh, name of that movie. But um, Hoosiers. Oh, Wesley Snipes was in it. Oh, what is no. it? No, I, I said Hoosiers, yeah. but I was wrong. But, Wesley no, Snipes, no, no, no. Yeah. yeah, but but that's, that was a long time. That was back in the eighties, also. And then we did oh, White Man Can Jump Ready video. Yeah, yeah, it was part of that. I think. I think. Oh, okay. Something with that. And then I may be wrong, but um, uh, all these guys, you know, over the years, they they always want something different, you know. So for Jeff, I was always experimenting with him, but um, he, you know, my, my most favorite thing was doing the the JB model for when he did Blow by Blow, you know. Oh yeah. And these kids should re- really listen to it and listen to that. And always back to basics too. I always go back to where my music started from. I started with the fireballs, you know, the ventures, of course, you know, I listened to old footage of the uh, Lawrence Welk show and everything. So for me mm-hmm. hearing that music and it puts me back to where the tone started from in my head, you know, and, and after a while, you know, you get so many, all the overdrives and all the effects pedals that everybody's using. You could, you could have a banjo and it would sound like a Stratocaster, you know, through some of the effects because there's so much going on with the equipment anymore. So, I, I always try to remember where the tone came from. And a couple important things is when the Les Paul was designed and the Stratocaster and the, say the Jazzmaster, uh, they were designed for strings, like 12 gauge strings, 12 or 13 gauge strings. So mm-hmm. they, the, the, the pickups were made for those kind of strings for the mm-hmm. output. And then people started using lighter and lighter strings and then right. the pickups didn't have the, the right output or the, it wouldn't generate the right kind of signal, you know. So uh, that's why we started doing calibrated sets and rever- I did the reverse one, reverse polarity for Stratocasters. So when you're in the two and four position, you're on stage, you don't get all that buzz from all the fluorescent lights and everything. And that, mm-hmm. that was the old days of what we had to deal with when you play in, in all the clubs. Like, in, And I played a lot in Atlantic City and and Wildwood, New Jersey, growing up in Philadelphia. And they all had this fluorescent light that would change colors and things that would flash. And that caused <laughs> havoc on single coil pickups, you know. So oh, that's yeah. why when I designed the stack pickup, uh, I did it for Buzzy Feetin. Uh, he was one of the first artists that I did it I know, for. Buzzy. You know? he was, yeah, he was playing in a band. And Michael Cimbella, when he did Maniac, that was the uh, pickup I did for him. And that was that those prototype stack pickups were in that song maniac so if you listen to it that that great guitar part that he did in it yeah you know? so uh i remember seeing did. i i remember some of those stack pickups in the early 80s and um i remember the uh, i think the cla- early classic stacks that you had done it had the maroon um, covers yes and uh yeah. in, in particular when i moved to uh i'm from detroit originally and i moved to uh, la uh, in uh, 1988, I think. Okay. So, uh, yeah. And I went to work for Andy Brower Studio Rentals. Wow. So oh, you probably great. yeah. Well, boy, come across Andy over the years, maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah. We've been all and uh, so there. There was a guitar, a very famous guitar that he had in the wall there. That wasn't anything special, but it was the um, it was a blue Stratocaster from uh, oh somewhere in the 80s. Nothing special. I think it was like maybe a classic, maybe a, a 57 reissue or something, but it was blue and I don't know, I'm not exactly sure, but it had classic stacks all loaded into it with the coil splits and everything. And Wow. Uh, and uh, that was the Billy Jean guitar that was used on Michael Jackson's. With that Billie David Jean. Williams? Yeah. That's the one David Williams used, right? Yeah, that's somebody the one brought David that up to me. Yep. Yeah, that, that's and it. That had Billy Jean the, and... Beat the it, maroon yeah. classic stacks in it. I remember that specifically. Yeah, that, yeah. Classic yeah. Stacks. And, uh, Somebody years ago brought that guitar up, and uh, we saw it. I hadn't seen it in years, you know. So I oh, yeah, really? brought it up. Yeah, they brought it yeah, to I the know. factory here. It got sold Farm. to someone. I don't know who, but um. yeah. But that man, that, that to me is, and David Williams. I mean, such a nice guy. Oh man, man. Too, and what, you know? what an amazing player! And uh, he was. He had a great. I mean, the rhythm, sweetheart, man. He could do. man. Yeah, and his yeah, daughter's he, out playing now too. You know. Oh yeah. This is great. Yeah, I forget her yeah, name. Yeah, it was sort of it was sort of sad to see yeah. when he died, and and, and oh and yeah, it's too young. A kind yeah. of what had happened to him at that point, and right, exactly. Yeah, yeah just a little. Oh, boy. Yeah, because I, I was in that era where That's where sad. he was. 
I, I I was 18 years old at the time when I first met him, and yeah, uh, and uh, and he was an amazing player for that kind of style of music. And oh, exactly, man. Yeah, yeah. and it, he just had the it, real deal, you know, like the real. Oh, really? Yeah. The real. Uh, now, the, since since you were from Detroit, did you ever know Jim McCarty up there? I, I don't know him, but I know, of course, of him. Okay, Jim McCarty played in Cactus, and uh, he played with uh, Tim Bogart and mm -hmm. Carmen Apiece and everything. Yep. But uh, in 1972, right before I left for England, Jeff Beck was doing, uh, I think, the second Rough and Ready, or uh, the Jeff Beck group, uh, before he did the, the, I think it was, it may have been called the Rough and Ready album. And uh, it wasn't the orange one, but it was the, the other one had all the pictures on the front of it. But it was at Trans Maxima Studio in Memphis. And I went down there and I met Steve Cropper, who was uh, like the manager or owner. He may have owned it. And uh, Ronnie Capone was the engineer. And uh, Ronnie took me back. He says, come here, I'm going to show you something. And he showed me Jeff Beck's Princeton Reverb that he did the, the, the album with, you know, going down and all that mm -hmm, stuff, mm -hmm. you know. And so they showed me the setup with the microphone, SM58, and hanging on it and everything. And uh, But uh, for me, it was pretty cool. But out back, there was another car park there, and there was a guy just sitting there, and it was Jim McCarty. And all uh -huh. of a sudden, we, we started showing each of our guitars and everything. And it was, it was really pretty neat, you know. And then, you know, months later, uh, I left for England, and I hooked up with uh, Jeff Beck and everything. And then Jeff Beck, uh, I built that tele give for him. And his manager, Ralph Baker, uh, assistant manager, came into the Fender Soundhouse where I was working. And he had, I swear to God, he had like an old roll up bag and it had all, all these things in it. And I said, what's this, Ralph? And he says, Jeff said, take your pick. And I, I swear to God, I opened the bag and it had a 54 Strat that I think belonged to Steve Marriott. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. He had a 51 Telecaster in it. And he had this old beat up guitar that was sort of car cutaway. And it was the Yardbirds guitar that he did, mm. Heart Full Soul and Train Kepper on and everything. So I, I said, Ralph, what about this this old Esquire, you know, from the Yardbirds? And, and, and he said, take it. You know, Jeff, Jeff said, you can take it. <laughs> so I was oh like, God. you, you got to be kidding, you know. <laughs> but, now, but now it's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I put it in Cleveland, you know, at oh. the, the Hall of Fame up there, just so other people could see it, you know. And I, yeah, must, of course, I, I, I must have seen it. I must have seen it because uh, I was at the yeah. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was really cool. I mean, I'm amazed to have that guitar. I'm so proud of it. You know, my God. Oh you my should, God. yeah. That's, absolutely. That's, cool. that's like when iconic. I, when I first heard, when I first heard a heart full of soul, man, that tone and the stories behind it and everything, it's like, oh, man. You know, and then Trink up rolling, wah, wah, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and the knobs would just flow so easy. And he had an old white strat knob on it, you know, and everything. And he had a different neck because I think, the original one got broken over with Keith Ralph or something, you know, but it was uh, such a, to me, a famous guitar. And then, you know, we took it to uh, uh, out and then Fender made uh, the reissues of it with Mike Aldridge mm -hmm. and stuff, you know. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and uh, so it, it was it was a fun one. We went back there, we dissected it. And I remember I, I had the guitar and I'm walking around with it and some security guard saw me with this guitar, you know. And he said, security, security. He's called, like, he said, what are you doing with this guitar? You know? <laughs> and, and uh, I said, it's my guitar. He says, it's not your guitar. Yeah. <laughs> and then he, he was all, all upset. You know, I said, I own this guitar. He says, no, you don't. It's on loan here from Seymour Duncan, you know? And it's like, I'm Seymour Duncan, you know? And it, it was funny, but you know, <laughs> I, I did cause a little stir back there. I thought, all the bars would come down on the uh, the building, you know. But it was a fun time. I had a great time back there. How long? Um, walking around back. Uh, yeah. Was, how long does the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame hold the guitar? You know, they've had it about, God, I mean, about 10 years now, I think. I mean, it's, it's probably maybe more than that. They've had it a pretty long time, you know. And, uh, wow. and I, I just I just let them use it because it's, it's they said yeah. it's one of their – and most important attractions, you know, and I just said, man, that's so cool, you know. And well, I imagine they rented from you, so yeah, that's cool. Well, it's better yeah. that everyone sees he, it, and you know, yeah. and exactly, closet, exactly. You know? Because, and and all these young guitar players that had the rave up album that saw that guitar, you know, it just 
means so much to them that that sound the whole yardbirds thing i mean yardbirds to me were so ahead of their time especially with jeff oh, playing so, guitar you know i mean it was yeah. like it's, it's it's pretty phenomenal you know speaking of the yardbirds it's funny i just i'll just interject a, a little quick story i when i was uh in new york and i was practicing with a band back then that went nowhere completely but they, this guy who owned the studio where we practiced was the yardbirds manager Giorgio gamelski you're kidding, really? He's so he's in New York then, huh? Wow. Well, yeah. Well, this was this was about this is 20 years ago, but I think he's still there. Wow. This yeah, is but he, yeah. Owns, he owns a building and uh, lets uh, you know bands practice in the building. But you, you know, Giorgio. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. man. Boy, oh boy, yeah. that's fantastic. You know. That's yeah, he was cool. a cool dude. He was an eclectic guy. That was for sure. Yeah, and, so. and and Peter Grant and all those guys, you know, were yeah. But, but the one guy I mentioned earlier, Lexus Corner. Uh, when I was working at the Fender Soundhouse, he would come in all the time with Jack Bruce. And uh, Jack always says, ah, these guitar players putting nines on their Les Pauls, man. Les Pauls, you have 12s and stuff, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and we, we always laughed about it. And, and, and Jack was just a great player. Just, just, a, just a good guy, too. Oh, and and we always got along, you know. And uh, uh, my family's from Scotland and everything. So I have, you know, he's from up there and everything. And, and the, the neat thing, but Alexis Corner... Is a guy that got so many bands together. I think he got like the Rolling Stones together or something. He like got musicians from different bands and put them together and made all these super groups out of them and stuff, you know. And but we would sit there and I showed him how to make a grilled cheese sandwich, which he, he just like, yeah, you know, he just he loved them, you know. It was so neat. We were like in the balcony <laughs> at the Fender Soundhouse and they had a little kitchenette there. And I'd go and I'd make him, you know, these grilled cheese sandwiches and put mustard on them. He he, he loved them, but he was. He was a neat guy too. And then I started hearing all this history about him and, and, uh, you know, Mark Boland. And then I was working with Green Slade and Banco Quiver and the Sutherland brothers. And, and, uh, and I was at a, a club called the Greyhound in Fulham. And it was the last show that Free actually did with Paul Kossoff and, oh, uh, wow. the band, you know. Wow. So I was in there and the opening band was a band called Stray Dog. And their guitar player was Snuffy Walden. And this is like 1973, I guess, you know, and, and uh, hanging yeah. out. And, and with Sn to this day, Snuffy and I are like just buddies. I mean, we're just soulmates, I think, you know. And But he, Snuffy was like burning it up. man, he was doing all this Henry stuff. But mm. I was down. We were down with Paul Kossoff. And Paul was showing me his guitar and everything. And. He he had he he was he was a cool guitar player too. You know, I always loved oh, Paul Kossoff. What he was amazing. doing no oh, man. I mean, to me, his vibrato over there. Yeah. It, oh, it's great. I know it was it was pretty it was very so distinctive. You know, yeah, very distinctive, very distinctive you know? player. Hey, I got a question yeah. for you um, from one of our okay. guests. Uh, I mean, from one of our viewers, uh, John Conklin um, wants to know: um, Have you ever done any work with with uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan? You know, that's another uh, thing. I used to wind a lot of pickups for Charlie's guitar before Charlie Wirtz passed away in uh, Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Charlie, I'd wind him a pickup and he let me keep one, you know. So he gave me hundreds of pickups over the years. And, and I heard through the wind that some of the pickups that I wound for him ended up in one or two of Stevie's guitars. So I don't really mm -hmm. know the one with the left-handed vibrato on it and everything. It may right. have been in that. I'm not really, you know, I don't know. You know, you once I know. do something, somebody says something to me and you don't know what happens to it after that or if the story is true or they want to make you feel good or something. You know? <laughs> but, but who knows, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, here's but another question. It, it, was, it was a fun, fun deal. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. Um Fernando Tavares has a question. What are your recollections of your time with George Lynch and the development of the Screaming Demon? Uh, George, too. You know, he would he would use a lot of our stock models and everything, but he was uh, always, again, trying to find something. And so, you know, we come up with different pole designs and different magnets and different things for the Screaming Demon. And, you know, it was sort of to his hearing what he would like what his taste was you know he wanted more mids and everything but just because he plays so fast that you don't want to pick up that'll distort too much where all the notes will muddle together so you gotta have a happy compromise so it doesn't uh, uh, you know lose 
or break up too much because mm-hmm. I mean he, he plays so fast. Like Ingve too, you know, you need to find something where these guys play so quick that right. you don't want us to all muddle together. And it can if you have a pickup that's too hot mm-hmm. or not sensitive enough to pick up what they're trying to do. But George, he's um, always. Um, I think we're doing another for him now, aren't we? For George Lynch? The Hunter. Yeah, the Hunter. And I'm not sure where he came up with that name. I'm not sure my other employees do. But you can you can write to MJ in the custom shop and ask her what why uh, George called his pickup the Hunter. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Is that um, his album's name? Oh, it's his album's name. So it's oh. one of his albums. So he named the pickup for the album. Uh, all right. So there there we you go. go. That's, That's cool. cool. Um, yeah, but, hey, we got a question from. Uh, what's that? Did she say? Oh, well, well, oh, she said that was the original pickup we did for him back in the '80s that he went back to. And it used he, to be called the Dawkins. The Dawkins used to be called the Dawkins, and then it became the Hunter. Oh, interesting. Um, so Tommy McDermott has a question for you. Um, can, he wanted to know. If uh, you can tell us a little bit about the the new Seymour Duncan Hyperion pickups that are in the new Ibanez AZ twenty two hundred four guitars. Oh boy, I don't know. That would have been probably engineering with uh, Kevin Beller. Who did that? Uh, the Hyperion. Hyperion. What is it? The yeah. Uh, what's it based on? I'm asking MJ. Um, okay. The Hyperion are the ones for, for Ibanez. For Ibanez. Um, and then the AG guitar. Yes, they're just a special wall and a special... Special thing. wall. <laughs> it's own, yeah, yeah. It's like its own thing. Also. It's yeah, it's its own thing. Is it the magnets, uh, any special magnets or anything? Special on the Eco 5, right? Alco 5, yeah, okay. Five. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. you know, everybody's doing something, you know, in the custom it's, shop and right. know, different, different names. And, you know, I, I don't do any of the marketing, so I don't know. You know, I just whine. I, I mean mainly hand wind all the pickups in here you can see these real quick sure if you can see these these are the uh the hendrix pickups some hand winding yeah and oh. we'll be talking about that pretty soon too so which is pretty cool you know and uh oh, so cool. i'm pretty pretty excited about these too which is pretty neat you know but can, you tell, us, can you tell us anything dozen. about that uh, not really too much yet. You oh, know? Okay. But, well it's well, coming. work well, <laughs> yeah. those those original pickups that I made for Roger Mayer to put in Jimmy's guitar. These are based on that era when I made the pickups for him, you know, and oh, awesome. I'm, Great. Uh, so they, they, they were, they were pretty, you know, unique at the time. And, and uh, he loved them. You know, he was like stoked by them and everything. So I don't know where the one guitar is. <clears throat> you know, I don't know where all his guitars ended up. I don't know if the family has them or his brother uh, has any, I'm not sure. Or his sister, Janie, you know, I don't know where they all went. But how, how much time do we have? How are we doing here? Oh, we're doing fine. It depends on how much time you've got. You know, we've been, we're I'm about fine. an hour, yeah, I mean, I'm about okay. an hour and ten, 10 minutes in. And, uh, yeah. you know, we've our, got... And, I'll t- and, uh, I'll tell our you shows got- are notoriously long, so... <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't mind. I mean, if you got questions and the kids are out oh, yeah, there... Oh, yeah. We've got more. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. There's, a, there's 225 people watching right now. Oh, good. That's great. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a we've got a lot of people watching, and I'm just going through the questions. Um, and uh, here's a great question from Grilled Chicken Salad. Um, Grilled Chicken Salad. Wow. Yes, that's, that's, that's his screen right. name. Yes, he wants to know. Can that's someone ask him more? Yep. Uh, why? I I I I heard he's a he's a vegetarian too. I don't understand that. So <laughs> that guy, chicken. <laughs> You grill chicken salad. Grilled chicken salad. So, um, I'm just doing stand up now. What can I try? Uh, he wants to know: Can can you tell us about all the different versions of the JB? Were there different versions of the JB? The, uh, uh, not too many. No, well, not really. You know, it's just uh, no. They're pretty. They, they all have the same amount of wire. Uh, I I did one version. Uh, uh, but I called it some. I called it the Eclair that MJ and I made here in the custom shop, and I use a different magnet and a little bit less turns for the way I play, you know. Mm-hmm. And that was sort of a version of the JB. Are same, you, are same. You put two on the bridge, I'll make four on the neck. Yeah, I'm using Annika two in the bridge and four in the neck. Rob cast, I'll make a minus. Yeah, Rob 
of Chaos of Sand, Annika Magnets. Uh, and then I I do things to the magnets, and and then uh, the way I, I set up my pickup and everything. So th that's just a little bit different. But the JBs have always been the same. You know, the, the only problem that somebody would see is maybe a different color wire, and that would be because the supplier couldn't give us the right you know form bar or the red you know polyethylene or urethane and wires, and then. Uh, uh, but they're all all the same magnet, all the same number of turns, same bobbin shape, same pitch, how many turns per layer. I mean, they're all pretty much the same, you know. And you mm -hmm. may have different uh, variants in the insulation where uh, the insulation may have varied maybe at some time or something. But normally they're, they're all wound the same. So there shouldn't be really any variations of it, except if somebody sees maybe a different color of wire, they may think it's a different variation or change in the pickup but it's all the same spec but mm -hmm. just the uh, cosmetic difference may be a little bit changed on it but they're that's still probably one of our biggest selling pickups ever you know and, and, and then, uh, and then the, isn't over the years the, the the makeup of the bobbins have changed like if the early ones were butyrate and then later it was a different material right well isn't, that happened with gibson yeah they used they yeah. went to a uh uh but you know, like all our antiquities are still the uh, original butyrates mm -hmm. and everything that we've been using for years and years. Uh, some of the other non vintage pickups may use a different uh, bobbin material for tolerances and for uh, shrink back mm -hmm. and everything and uh, the wearability and the whole bit. So there's there's so many different uh, factors in that, you know, that we're always trying to find something that'll be durable. You know, we want pickups to last 100 years if we can, you know, for that lucky, you know. And uh, so, uh, you know, we're always experimenting with stuff, too. So it just depends on what what the product is. Uh, we've always used the vulcanized fiber for all the single coil pickups that's mm -hmm. out there where other people would use linen phenolic, which isn't really the vintage kind of material used for a vintage pickup, you know, except what they call it, you know. But the vulcanized fiber is what we've always used, and uh, it's pretty cool, you know, material. So that's where it all began. No, that's awesome. That's Excellent. good stuff. I just cracked up, cracked open another beer. I'm sorry, I'm making noise. Um, so we have <laughs> another. Spill it. <laughs> I've done that before, actually. Um, yeah. So we've got a question here. Uh, interesting question for you, Seymour. Um, and I don't know if you've ever done any work with Jimmy Page before, but yeah, there's a, a lot of Page. Yeah. Oh, you have. Okay. So the question here is about um, what work you've done with Jimmy Page, and then also the inspiration behind the whole lot of love humbuckers that you made, and how they might be different than, say, the antiquities. Well, they they're more like a '59 pickup that I had done for him, and then uh, they're. You know, the magnet, the, the wire, uh, the way the calibration is and everything. And uh, it's, it's different than a uh, pretty much any other kind of pickup. You know, it's, it's got his own voicing. And he's had those same pickups in his guitar for probably 30 years, too, you know, which is pretty cool, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. his, his main guitar, when they pulled it out, it had, had his pickup in there that, that I had signed for him and everything way back. I don't even know know when it was put in you know but he says it's been in there forever you know which is really pretty cool you know and and i i was playing in uh well i was working in lima ohio years ago and the yard birds were playing there and uh that's when i first met jimmy and everything mm. and uh he he was playing a telly and i have a photo of it where you know that scrapbook you said would would be kind of cool yeah <laughs> but the back of it, you, 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 you can that. see it says Jeffman written on the back of it. And I think that became the guitar that was painted psychedelic. Ah. And then what he did the three albums with it first. It got stolen, albums. I think, right? Got stolen, no. yeah. But th then he well, got it back, I think. But somebody had taken out the electronics in it and put it back a different way. And he said it never sounded the same. So I don't think he ever reused it again, you know. So, so he I, did get I, it back. I, so he did get it back. I, huh? Well, I, then. I think I'm not the sure, dragon. Yeah. Are we talking about the dragon guitar? The psychedelic. The, the dragon the psychedelic guitar? telecast. Call it. 
Yeah, yeah it's like a dog the, dog dragon dog. Pain. Yeah. And then and then he had a he had a tech at some point that, that decided as a gift to repaint it for him. Oh really? And yeah. you know, the dragon went away then, and, and supposedly hearsay says it never sounded the same again. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah, because when I saw it, it, the pickups didn't look like to that year what it was before. It was like a, I think like a '61 Telly or something, '62 Telly originally that Jeff had, and then uh, then then he gave it to Jimmy, or Jimmy sort of kept it. You know, I'm not sure about that. Poor Jeff, man. He loses so many guitars. He, he, had, one, he, had, he had one in his uh, Les Paul in the back of his Corvette, you know, and he was parked somewhere downtown London, and he came out and was gone. He couldn't figure out why the poor guitar was gone, you know, I felt oh, bad no. for him. And th that's why I made him the Telegib to replace the guitar that he had stolen. And it was like, I called it the poor man's Les Paul because it was made from a Tele body, and then it had the, the JB in it and the JM for John Milner. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how yeah. that, that whole thing came about. So and I think cool. he, he, he also used it on the secret, secret policeman's ball. Did anybody, you guys see that at all? Or you guys players out there? I, I, I had seen it a long time ago. It's been a long time. Yeah. But he, he used that guitar for that show too. You know, you can see it. it's like a sort of a, Oh, blonde telly kind of worn away a little bit. And, the cut bridge played on the tail and mm. had had the, the uh, Lonnie Mac pickup in the bridge and it had a patent fly for it that I rewound in the neck. So it was that's and I couldn't cause it to John Milner. Like I said, you know, nobody would know who John Milner was, but it was it was a fun time. You know, I mean that whole era, you know, and the excitement and these and you know what was sad too is as uh, what I miss is these guitar players were hunger hungry for a tone or finding something unique, you know, and and yeah. you had a chance to work with them, like firsthand, to get them something. I did Breakfast in America with uh, uh, Super Tramp. You know, I did the pickups for uh, Roger, and uh, so it was um, that excitement, you know, doing that, and then uh, hearing it being played, you know, in the, in the studio and everything. So for me, that's the fun part of it. I'm holding my earplug in here so I can hear you guys. But uh, you know, there's so many stories out there, and. And all you young players and guys have been playing for years, you know, just go out and meet all these guitar players and, and learn something. You know, you learn something from somebody every day. I mean, you listen to a new guy mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, just, you know, just enjoy it. And music is to have fun and, and meet people and go out and play and perform. And when I was a kid, you know, 12, 13, I couldn't even stand in, in my class and give it. I was so shy. I couldn't. I, I would stutter and I would I would I was so shy. And it was hard for me to uh, uh, talk in front of people. And then I had to do a report. And I said, what am I going to do a report on? You know, and I said, I know. I'll do a report on my guitar. So I had my, my Sears Silvertone Jupiter guitar. And I talked all about it. I drew a picture of it. And I told what each, each thing did on the guitar and how it was tuned and the whole bit, you know. And I, that was the first time I got, ever got an A on my book report in my life. You know? <laughs> and I, just, I, just, I just thought it was, you were it was so it. cool. You know? Exactly. That I was, was into it. You yeah. were way into it, yeah. yeah. So that, that was, for me, you know, important that I had something. That, and then, you know, I was an only child, so I didn't really have anybody to, you know, I lived out in the country and there weren't a lot of people around. And, uh, but I had my guitar. So that was, that was my main thing. And then my yeah. uncle... Mm -hmm. Uncle Howard Duncan uh, showed me my first chords and everything, and he played country guitar. But uh, it was here in, like, you know, like I said, the Shantays on the Lawrence Welsh show and uh, doing Pipeline, you know, which is just an incredible song and that uh, Bob mm -hmm. Strickard wrote. And uh, to this day, we're friends, which is so neat. I mean, me back then, you know, 12, 13 years old, seeing this band on TV, realizing that someday You'll be they're, friends they're going to be my friends, man. I'm going to be their friends. And Noki Edwards. And like with Les Paul, you know, it's like, oh man, you know, it's like, I, I'm so proud. Like, you know, I'm so proud of it. You should yeah, be you proud. Should be, you should be proud. And, uh, yeah. so that's but, amazing, but, amazing accomplishments. Amazing. Yeah, accomplishments. I'm honored that I, I love meeting guitar part. players, you know, and uh, <laughs> all their, all their, I have letters. I, I have all the letters that people have written to me about pickup questions and everything. So I have a lot of, a lot of things I can do, you know. Wow. I've, I've been working with Vinny's Guitar Magazine for many, many years. Oh, yeah. They've always always been great. And uh, and all the specs that I have on all these pickups that have been used, like Maniac, you know, I had the specs for that. You know, I had the, 
the stuff I did with, you know, uh, David Williams with uh, Michael Jackson mm-hmm. and everything, you know. And a uh, mm-hmm. cool letter here I got from uh, Eric Johnson years ago, you know. And Eric oh, wow. was just an incredible guitar player. I mean, he's just fantastic, you know. And, and he's always been, he just has the tone and the touch and he's always like listening, you know. And, mm-hmm. and uh, he would, and I would do do a Sonics for him. He would love do a Sonics, you know. And, Here's another letter from him. You know, they would sit and actually write you a letter, you know, which was yeah. so cool. You know, That's so rare so cool. these days. It so is rare man. these days. Yeah, it's real rare, well, we, you know. And, it's non existent well, these days. Let's put Yeah, exactly. You know. It's interesting because someone someone just recently said to me, gave me some advice. <laughs> even in business, they said, if you want to get somebody's attention, write a letter. I was that, like, that's probably true because they're, they're not expecting it. Yeah. Know, yeah. It, no it's one's pretty like, cool, oh, you know. Yeah. So no one writes a letter know, anymore. Hey, yeah, I got a question so, for you. Um, okay. So do I. I so, got two also. Okay. You want to go first, Dave? Sure. So so someone in the chat here asked, uh, talk about the differences in El Nico magnets, five, two, four, et cetera. That's Stephen Mike one. Yeah, they're both. I was going to ask the exact same question. Yeah. Uh, they hold ho- – the El Nico magnets have a different – amount of cobalt, nickel, uh, different ferrous materials that will build up the, the, uh, the amount of it. And a lot of times, you know, I'm sure back in the day and back in the 50s, especially when they were, uh, the magnets, like the rod magnets were sand cast. So they would take a long rod, maybe eight inches long, nine inches long, put it in an actual block of sand. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then they had little funnels and they would pour the dirt or uh, into the dirt, this molten, alnico material and uh it's like almost making a, a a drink or a cake or something each each magnet had a different amount of of material in it different amounts of cobalt cobalt was probably the biggest difference and uh, the normally the higher the cobalt uh the stronger the magnet the more uh brightness you'll get out of the magnet uh you'll have you can get more sustained because it produces more movement of the magnetic field through the coil from the string vibration. And as, like I was saying earlier, when guys are using very thin strings today versus one, what the pickups were originally designed for. So you're going to have a output uh, deficit uh, when you use lighter strings. So people started using, you know, even samarium cobalt and the ceramic magnets, which I, I don't really care for. We make pickups with them, but, uh, they can actually, the t- too strong of a magnetic field can slow down your string vibration and you'll get the initial attack. It'll jump right out at you. But sometimes you'll lose a certain amount of sustain unless it's a, a feedback sustain or a microphonic uh, feedback. And then, but normally like the Alnico 2s are a little bit warmer, softer. Uh, 3s are in between. And uh, it's funny, if you look at it, you can go... Uh, on probably probably go to Google and look up uh, Alnico magnet properties, and it'll give you a whole chart of all the different magnets, and it'll tell you how much cobalt's in it, how much, and look at each one, and and uh, you you can see that it'll have a, give you a chart of what the energy is and everything. And normally, you know, you, you think higher the number, the more uh, output you'll get from it, and in some cases it may be true, but I think like even Alnico 2 has more cobalt in it than uh, Alnico 5 or something. There's so- something weird in, in the chart there somewhere. I can't remember. But, uh, you know, you guys out there should check it out. Look at it. It's pretty neat to find. and Just look at the differences of the magnets. So when people, guitar players or manufacturers, are talking about specifications, they'll talk about different types of magnets. So, you know, Alnico 2, Alnico 3, Alnico 4. And, and a lot of it is the measurement of the magnetic gauss and they have actual gauss meters and we have one here something like this and you can actually see it'll tell you how strong a magnet is when you put it on there it'll tell you if it's north polarity or south polarity and mm. uh th- these are pretty neat you know and they work pretty well but uh normally the higher the magnetic field the more energy will can be produced out of a particular pickup but sometimes I'll take a an Alnico 5 and I can drop it down to an Alnico 3. And that would be 
like the strength of an Alnico three magnet. So most mag Alnico magnets you can you can mess around with, which is pretty cool, you know. And there's not a lot of people doing that, but we've been doing it probably. I I built my first Dunstunner and a whole bit back in the eighty early eighties, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I've been doing that stuff for years, you know. Stuff for like Eddie or Jeff Beck, I'll do that. I'll mess around with uh, different yeah, calibrations. Yeah, and Billy Gibbons, yeah, has been one of my big guinea pigs. You know, I mean, he's hmm. he's yeah. he's been pretty amazing over the years. I mean, I, we've he done hundreds super, hundreds of pictures lights. for him. He uses light strings, so he, he really uh, does too. You know, yeah, he does yeah. And so how you know, does... another one, another guy I was I was amazed was uh, James Burton, and uh, at, I was. I was told that he would use three A tenor banjo strings in the Ricky Nelson days. So they were like so light, but he could really just do all this just incredible. Uh, and there was a band way back uh, that I grew up with called the Sterling Brothers back in uh, South New Jersey. And these guys would play just Hernandez Highway by the Ventures and they would do all this just great, cool music. And they were two guitar players. And one guy, uh, Mark, he had a, uh, an, a 61 Les Paul, uh, you know, the white one, uh, three pickup custom. Mm -hmm. And he would use three A tenor banjos on that, too. And his action was like a 16th of an inch from the string. And he played so light. But he got such a great sound. And he used a, uh, the Gibson stereo amplifier, the uh, RVT 79 GT or GT, you know, the stereo amplifier. So, but he just got this great sound out of it, great reverb unit and everything. So, hmm. so the, the magnets can vary a bit, you know, for you to get an understanding of it, you should look at, look at the chart and then you can see what materials in it. And normally, you know, the cobalt, you can see the, the amount, normally the higher the cobalt, a little bit more, but th that's not always true, you know, so don't, you know, quote me on that or anything. So that's a good question though. No, that's great. Dave, you had a follow-up question? Yeah, right? I had a follow-up question that John McDonald had. So what's the story with the Warren D. Martini pickup? The Warren D. Martini pickup. Well, yeah. that's another one that uh, MJ helped him with in the custom shop. And it's more of a, a mid, it's in between a, a what? How much, what's the DC on that, do you? It's about seven. It's kind of a slightly overwound JB with a special calibrated Alnico 2 magnet. Yeah, it has a calibrated Alnico 2 magnet and rough then cast magnet. rough cast magnet, sand cast, basically. Okay. One, one of the things that they have to understand in the custom shop, we use, I mean, a smaller diameter, like the old, all the spacers, you know, I mean, you, you're aware of that. I mean, the uh, wood spacers. The, the drill spacers. Drill spacers, yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The coupling is better. Than, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, and in, in the custom shop, we use... The tolerances are really close from the screw to the uh, the metal spacer and everything. So mm. there's a lot of the things that are important so you don't lose. There's a couple things I'll, I'll explain. A single a six string pickup is actually not perfectly designed. Uh, the problem is, is like your, your E and, and A aren't working as well as the A and the, uh, like the D string, because th those, when, when you pluck an A string, you have a magnetic field on the E string and a magnetic field on the D string that are interfering with the magnetic field on the A string. But when you, when you pluck the bottom E string, you don't have that opposing magnetic field on the bottom side to interfere with the, uh, the A string or the E string. So you're, you're so, you know, so uh, um, I've used like eight string uh, lap steel pickups on a six string guitar. That way you got the same kind of magnetic field pushing against the opposing string uh, area. And then uh, the, uh, the humbucker, I call it the H effect uh, or the four effect. And then there's the H effect, which is like the, uh, oh, the Alan Holdsworth pickup that we used to do and still do. But the four effect is you have your pole piece, it comes down, goes through the metal spacer, and it, it, it sticks out of the bottom of the pickup, maybe a quarter of an inch, where the stud side, it just goes to the stud and directly to the magnet. So you, you're not losing any of the magnetic field out the bottom of the pickup, where you do with a traditional humbucker. Mm -hmm. So that, that can affect the sound a lot. And a lot of guys would uh, uh, cut the pole pieces off to make them shorter, 
that way you get a U effect, so you get a more of a direct coupling uh, to the string. And the magnet is in a pickup to magnetize the string. So when the string vibrates, it moves the magnetic field through the coil, and the coil then generates an alternating current that goes to your amplifier. That's basically it's like a transformer. Yeah, it's an mm -hmm. inductor of some sort, you know. No, oh, that's great. No, it's amazing technical information. It's kind of confusing, but yeah, it's like, I mean, there's so many little variables, you know. So oh, it's amazing. It's pretty cool, though. Yeah. Um, so. so we were talking about Billy Gibbons before. Uh, what about the Pearly Gates pickups? Can you tell us uh, something about that? Uh, and that was from Brent Harmon. Well, thanks, Brent. Brent, yeah, thanks, Brent. Yeah, I did the Pearly Gates for Billy Gibbons, you know, and that was, uh, he brought one of his uh, guitars at his Les Paul up years ago called the Pearly Gates. And uh, so I, I had the, uh, I had to get all, you know, measure it, and I didn't want to mess with the pickup, but I once I, I got the, the DC and the inductance and everything. 1980. Yeah, 1980, I did the Pro Gates here. Where is it at here? These are all ZZ Top specs and everything. Sort of blocked <laughs> out a little bit, but, but, but the Pro Gates came of that. And then I, I started, that's where I started messing with the magnet and everything. So I don't know how that is. That's kind of, you know, it's pretty hard to, to figure because you have to make the machine first to be able to do what you need to do to the magnet. Mm -hmm. But I, I um, work, I got the DC right on and then the calibration. And I did like uh, PG1, PG2, PG3. And everybody says, PG, well, a parent guy or something <laughs> for a movie. You know, I said, no, no, it's for the Pearl Gates, you know. And uh, so I had different... Uh, Minus yeah, calibration. different magnet calibrations yeah. for that until, because he he wanted, and then he would bring a bunch of guitars to me, and I had to do each one. So when he would change his chord on stage, he would, didn't have to go run back and change the the settings on his amplifier. So I had to match up all these different guitars, you know, to to have the same kind of output and the same kind of frequency response, which mm -hmm. was pretty cool, you know, back then. And then I also did it for. Um, uh, Steve from Iron Maiden and everything, you know, and hmm. and we had to calibrate all his bass pickups. Uh, so when he would change bases, one could be real heavy, another one could be real light, but they all had to sound the same. So, you know, they wouldn't have to go change all the settings on the amp or run. He could just play it and change his bass, you know. So, but I I, I did a lot of that over the years, you know, the, the custom uh, configuration of everything, which was really cool, you know. So for me. Uh, you learn a lot, you know, and, and it's, you know, you, you, you do so many trial and error things, you know, you try this and try that, you know, and, uh, um, and one, one time this guy came to me with a telecaster and he wanted to sound like Roy Buchanan and, uh, oh no, this was another guy. He, he wanted to just have a, a good Jimmy Bryant kind of sound. And, uh, he wanted a, uh, pickup that wasn't so tinny sounding. So I wound these pickups for him. And uh, he said, oh, my potentiometers are real scratchy, you know. And he said, what, what should I do? I said, well, just go out and get uh, 250K audio tape for potentiometers, you know. So he comes back like a week later and he said, man, this is the worst sounding guitar I ever heard, you know. And he said, there's no highs in it whatsoever, you know. <laughs> I said, what do you mean no highs? I said, that pickup could have uh you know made a cat squeal you know two blocks away you know <laughs> so anyway he brings it back i make another pickup and this sucker would have bro broken glass if you put a slide bar on it you know mm. and uh he says man horrible man I, I can't get any tone out of my my guitar and i looked at it and he, he brought his guitar to me. i said bring your guitar in and uh and i said oh my god i said i see what you did he said, what did i do he says you put 250, two, or two number twos, two of them, two each, 50K audio tape for potentiometers, which would knock all your high ends <laughs> yeah. off, off your pickups, yeah. you know. I yeah, mean, all, you know, all amp, gone. All, you know, and so it should have been a 250K, right, and he got 250 250Ks. K. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, but once he put it in, it, it, you know, the cats were running to the, the balcony, you know, to get out of there, you know, but, <laughs> but that, we, we got funny. him set up great, you know, but, uh, after that, but, you know, even guys will change, they'll, they'll take their 59 strat to a repair shop because the volume control may be like scratching really bad, you know, 
So they'll put a, a brand new uh, 250K audio taper in the bridge position, you know, where the old one was. And what happens is sometimes the, uh, the tolerance was like plus or minus. It could be 20, 20 degrees, you know. Sure, you guys it could would be know, 200K uh, pot or variance, you know? 275K so it, pot. Or... <laughs> his, his original pot could have been uh, 250K right on, so he had that tone. But then when he put in the new one, it could have been a, uh, say, uh, 290K. So that would have made his strap pickup sound brighter. So when a guy gets the guitar back, he says, man, what do you do? You changed my pickups. You know, it doesn't sound like, like my old guitar anymore. Mm. And so you have to make these guys understand that when you're doing that, you got to make sure you're to the closest value potentiometer because it's going to make the sound change yeah. in the rest of your guitar, Absolutely. the rest of the output. And so I tell them, like on an old Strat, take the tone control, one of the tone controls that you hardly ever use anyway, use one of those and put that in the bridge position or in the uh, in the volume setting, and then mm -hmm. put the old one back in where the tone is because you just leave it probably turned up anyway or you don't use it that much. Because there, there's, so, there's something sort of magical about the older pots too. They're, exactly, exactly. They're just better. Uh, well, the thing is, a lot of them are fine. Or like 230, 220, yeah. instead of the two. Yeah, it says 250 on it, mm -hmm. but then you got your 20 plus or minus 20 tolerances, and they're usually like low for some reason. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it'll make the pickup sound a lot warmer and everything. So. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants you to talk about Seth Lover and what was he like? Oh, so, okay. MJ just what, said what somebody's was asking about, about Seth Lover. Seth Lover. Oh, yeah. Tell us more. Yeah, well, Seth, you know, I met him back in the uh, early 80s maybe late, late 79, during one of my first NAMM shows and everything. And uh, uh, he walks up to me and he, he says, uh, are you Seymour? I said, yes, sir. And he said, my name's Seth Lover. So I, I didn't really think about who this guy was because, you know, you, people don't put, didn't put the history out of about too many people. And he says, well, I'm the guy that designed the Gibson uh, patent applied for humbucker. I said, you're kidding so we just started talking and talking and chatting about it. So he invited me down to his house and his wife, uh, LaVon, she made me tea and she showed me her uh, uh, little teaspoon collection and everything. I mean, it was, it was incredible, you know. And so Seth, he starts pulling out all this stuff and we start talking about, like I said earlier, about the ham radio. And uh, but he uh, he had all his notes uh, when he, he designed the Firebird pickup, he designed the staple pickup. Mm. And so he had all his original drawings for all these pickups and everything, you know. And uh, so when, you know, he was retired, he was he was just he had a friend that was repairing uh, uh, vacuum cleaners and he was delivering vacuum cleaners to the people. And I said, what's this guy delivering vacuum cleaners for, you know, for and he was he was getting like a 60 dollar a month pension from a, a fender. After because he designed a fender wide range humbucker and everything, and then um, Evan Scop and I, who Evan was one of my marketing guys, uh, we went down and spent time with him. We wanted to uh, uh, see if we could do something with him, you know, help this guy and and maybe do a pickup, you know, or something. And uh, and we we started talking about it. We we came on this price, and he says, no, 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 no. I said, well. That's what normally what we give a royalty. It's called a royalty to people and everything. For each pickup sold, you'll get a royalty. And then, uh, uh, and then he thought about it. I said, Seth, man, you know, your grandkids or something, maybe you could help them or, you know, you guys could buy a new TV or whatever you want, you know. And, and then, then we, 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 we did the agreement, you know, and then we started doing the actual uh, uh, Seth Lover model pickup, you know. And he was like, became a celebrity, you know, after we were at the NAMM show and he was down there, he was signing autographs left and right. And I felt so proud to be able to bring this out. And then we went over and saw Ted McCarty and, and I was over there with uh, Paul Reed Smith. And, and we each had, a, we had our group picture taken with, uh, you know, Ted McCarty and uh, Seth Lover. And Seth used to work with Ted McCarty at Gibson. So for us, it was a magical moment, and everything, you know, seeing all that and that. Uh, so it was it was really uh, just a great thing coming up with this thing, and we wanted to do like a 
traditional was made back in the 50s mm -hmm. more so than what it was nowadays after being played for 50 years like i was doing with the antiquities and everything so the, the seth lover became a pickup that was uh it just had had to sparkle to it like you get when you you remember when you picked up your your first les paul in 1958 you know, and you heard this pickup you know and it just had this tone to it and then mm. that's what it was we didn't overwind it or, or do anything but we did you know we did special things because back when we were measure old pickups the magnets were really they would vary a lot and that was due to the specification from the manufacturers and Fender or gibson and fender were using different suppliers uh to, to get their you know the raw materials cut and everything and then mm. each one would have their own own supply and some would have a different slightly uh cobalt or the nickel so you have all these variances and even though they may call it let's call this an Alnico 5. They may call it an Alnico 5, but it could have been in like an Alnico 3 category or an Alnico 2 or an Alnico 4. And when we would measure old patent ply fours and you would regouse them to find out what they were, they were like a 2, 3, and 4. You know, they weren't like the, the 5, which they started using later when it became a shorter magnet and hmm. humbuckers. So so there, there, there's all these different variables, you know, which is pretty cool, you know. And, yeah. and we studied all that. I mean, I've done... I have books and books and books of, of notes that we've taken on on uh, everything I've measured. Every pickup I've, I've wound for the past 30 years, I've taken apart, you know. So, Seymour, so, uh, so the dunk, so the different, the cool. difference. Hold on. What's, what, MJ? I said, Seymour, you know, 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 call and say thank you because thanks to you my mom and dad could have that extra coffee that extra life that they couldn't have if they wouldn't met you oh, wow. i'm very yeah, proud yeah. of that yeah it was, it was, i was so proud of that you know it gives you tears and, yeah and i was i was by seth That's amazing um, by his bedside when he passed away and everything mm -hmm. you know and uh, for me i was oh. i was so honored that the family took me in because they, they knew how much we enjoyed each other and seth loved coming up to santa barbara and uh visiting with us and uh and he was such a important part of music history i mean the humbucker oh, yeah. pickup which is probably the most copied pickup in the world you know and and this guy guy did it and so for me and then the, the gibson guitar company gave his uh, grandchildren a, a les paul and we had the, the pickups in it and everything so you know it, it's really it makes you feel good and that that's for me that's so important you know and i have to say yeah. too is like you know i'm, I'm seymour duncan I, i try to be a role model for the employees here and all the all the friends and our, all the reps that are out there and all the stores that sell our product and everything mm -hmm. but it's the seymour duncan family here that that make the product every day you know and, and they're the people who are seymour duncan you know i'm i'm maybe the the seymour w duncan but the, the, everybody here mj and 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 Keith and all the guys in sales and my son, Derek is working here and Kathy. Uh, they're all uh, the important part of, of what the Seymour Duncan is. And we, we care for the musician, you know, we try to help mm -hmm. them. And, you know, longtime friend, you know, we were with Terry Reed, who was going to be the original singer in Led Zeppelin, but he turned it down for a solo career. And, uh, oh boy! Whoops! So, yeah, whoops! Yeah. <laughs> whoops! No, whoops! But, But but Terry, I mean he's he's a great guy and uh, he's still you can find his you should listen to him you know go on uh, uh, YouTube or go on uh, you know what is it, you know iTunes and uh, listen to some of his material man but he, mm -hmm. you know it'll just send and and even people that I've met outside like uh, Brian Auger I mean I love Brian Auger you know and and he worked with Julie Driscoll back in the 60s and 70s and Trinity. And he's a Hammond B3 player. And the way he plays, you know, it's just, just I mean, I just, just, I just love it. And, and I'm friend, I've been friends with him for years and years. And uh, so I, I've been very honored. Like my studio, I can't get much more in it, you know, <laughs> all, all the records I have and, oh, and all the guitars. And Pete Anderson uh, worked with Dwight Yoakam. You know, I did so much with Dwight and Pete Anderson. You know, he's just a tone. I mean, 
and and to hear what what you've done here, it, it's really a great feeling, you know. And oh man, and, what a, uh, what a and, what a career, Seymour. I mean, I it's, know it's an amazing career. And, uh, I, we got a question. Well, also, um, sorry to interrupt you. I wanted to jump in on. Yeah. Uh, we had for Slash and Angus Young. If you could tell us some stories about yeah, that. Yeah, boy. Well, they, um, ACDC, they would actually come to Santa Barbara here, and uh, uh, I'd have their guitars and uh, for Malcolm and everything. And we, I had their original pickups that they did most of the, they used in their Gretsch guitars and everything. And I would dissect these pickups, you know, and I still have drawers full of all their original parts and specs and everything that, that I wound for him, you know, and, uh, oh. uh, and like slash too, you know, I mean, he was an important part and, and we did a lot of just custom thing, tweaking the amount of output on the, the turns, uh, the tension, uh, the pitch of a pickup, you know, that all changes the, uh, inductance and everything in it and how it works with the magnet stuff. So, I mean, everybody has their own story, you know, each, each one has their own, uh, uh, recipe, I guess you would say, you know, and mm -hmm. we have uh, drawers of recipes. And, you know, if you look at, uh, I saw a website that had a picture of uh, the Fender Custom Shop. And what was really neat is they had a, a thing with all the neck templates and it had all these neck, necks hanging on a wall and, and it had mm -hmm. people's names written on it. And I saw one of them that had Seymour Duncan, which I thought was so cool because at one time, I had a signature Esquire that uh, was built. Mike Eldridge and the guys in the custom shop uh, built it. And it was like a two-tone sunburst and a uh, beautiful guitar. Hmm. And uh, James Taylor bought a couple of them. And to different friends that knew this was a cool guitar. You know, it's, they're hard to find anymore. But uh, but I saw my neck, my neck plank. And I, I like a, a little bit wider neck because I, I use my thumb a lot. And I remember uh, hearing uh, these friends of mine that play guitar, and their, their teacher always said, "Never use your thumb on the keyboard or on the fingerboard." You know, and oh really? I said, what? I said what? <laughs> so tell that to Chet Atkins, you know. And, right, and Jimi Hendrix and everybody. So, <laughs> and, so my my fingers are kind of short, and uh, so I like a little bit wider and thinner neck, and I could get around, and and I love like doing the James Burton stuff, you know, and that, that, that get the bottom thumping, and then you play the high stuff. Mm -hmm. And I did a CD in 1976 with Merle Haggard. It's called 1996, 1996. And uh, so I was up there and uh, with Clint Strong. And then I went to Nashville and, and I did a, a bunch of shows for, you know, the uh, all-star guitar night with Muriel Anderson. I mean, she's just phenomenal. Yeah. And there I played guy with Dwayne Eddy and Les Paul and, and Jerry Donahue, God bless him. You know, he had a four stroke and, and Brett Mason and Johnny Highland and, and oh, wow. uh, we had actually had we had actually had John uh, 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 Peter Frampton on one of the gigs with us and stuff you know and uh, so doing shows like that for me you know I was basically a sponsor that had a a chance to get up and play with these people but I was so proud to to get up and play with them yeah so it was it was uh, it was neat playing at the Ryman I mean you go in there and it's like holy mackerel like the walls talk to you and all the old photos of mini pearl and string bean and all these people that performed at the opry you know what opera uh the ryman theater so uh things like that you remember you know and and mm -hmm. i'm not up there I, i'm always take, taking pictures you know so i got like cameras and i got Noki edwards and Dwayne eddie on the chair and they're goofing around and everything and uh um uh, it, it was it was magical you know i mean i, I like i said I, i've been so lucky but there's so many guitar players I've been, you know, all you guys, I really appreciate, you know, you, you know, being here with us and listening to what we're talking about and just oh, my stories, you know, that, that I grew up with, you know, that was so important to me and, and, uh, seeing Roy Buchanan and, you know, my, all that stuff, Dwayne Eddy, you know, is, is important. That's great stuff. Uh, it's really great. Um, We've got so many questions and so many people who are commenting on the chat and and uh, one one of the comments uh, I'll read from Frank McNail. He said, "This is so moving. Seymour is crazy humble. I mean, the guy is a legend, and his family is legendary. And it's just thankful as can be. It's really heartwarming listening to him speak. Love it. Well, I, I, so. I really appreciate that. You know, I mean, it's kind, and uh, uh, you guys are the same way out there. You know, I mean, I, you guys are." your players and, and you got your soul that hears a certain kind of music and you love it. And, 
and and expand it, you know, just just share it with people, you know, which is so important, and and be helpful to other young players and everything too, or guys that don't have a chance to get out and play, you know, and yeah, show them a yeah. court or, or a neat lick or something, you know. Yeah. I'm always stealing Jeff Beck stuff. Yeah, yeah, you never <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and one 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 quick story is that I went into Antone's in Austin, Texas, and this band's up there playing, and. uh and the guy stops and he says, you know, I want to tell you a story. He says, when I was like 16 years old, I went into this booth at the NAMM show. It was one of my first NAMM shows. And uh, he said, this guy came over to me and he says, hey, I like what you're playing, you know. And uh, he says, you know, by the time I left, you know, this guy gave me a pickup, you know. He says, go home and try this, you know. And and uh, he says, it was Seymour Duncan, you know. And uh, he says, I, I want you to give a round of applause for Seymour Duncan. He just came in to the club here and uh, he says, uh, I really appreciate what he did for me and giving me that, that ability to get out there, you know, and it was Gary Hoey who did oh. uh, Ho Ho Hoey. Know, Gary, yeah. 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 And, and, and I thought that was so nice for him to, to do that, you know, and, uh, uh, He's a nice guy. yeah. And it's, it's neat that, you know, and, and look at what he's doing now these days and everything, you know, and, and all the stuff, you know, me meeting Dick Dale and everything. Dick Dale, I swear to God, actually drew. He says I hear things differently. He, and I said, "What do you mean, Dick? You know, what do you hear?" He says, "My cochlea and my ear is shaped differently than other people." <laughs> and I swear to God, he got a napkin at the club and he drew what his cochlea, his whatever cochlex, whatever it's called, <laughs> in his ear, what it looked like. He drew me a picture of it, you know. And I said, "This is cool," you know, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so stuff like I mean I have boxes and boxes. Oh, uh oh, we lost Seymour. We lost him. Technical difficulties, people. Seymour, join us back if you can, please. There, I lost. Yep. You. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. No problem. Wait, we lost you. In... Yeah. Then we can see you now. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. But no anyway, problem. It's um, it, someday, like you said, I need to photograph a lot of this memorabilia and like letters from Eric Johnson. I got stuff from Roy Buchanan that he sent to me. Jeff Beck was always sending me stuff. Bill Gibbons sends me stuff probably every month. He'll he'll see it like an arrow because I collect arrowheads and and he'll see uh, artifacts in a, some store in like Albuquerque, New Mexico, and he'll send me a pin shaped like an arrowhead, which I think is so great, you know. And, and he'll send me a whole plaque of uh, uh, flint napping and arrowheads that somebody had done that made a display out of it. So I have just some it's really cool memorabilia. And and James Taylor gave me a, a gold album for working with him over the years and everything. And uh, that's amazing. You know, uh, ZZ Top, the, the stuff they sent me, you know. It's, did you, you know, so tell us about Dick Dale. Um, so did you ever work with Dick Dale or, or no? I, I don't, I don't know if I did. I know several of of his original guitars had gotten, you know, modified, you know, like somebody worked on it and things got changed out of it. So, um, I don't think I, I've ever, uh, done too much for Dick. We may have sent him pickups and stuff. And I worked with his bass player. I can't remember his name, but, uh, we did a lot of stuff for the band, you know, the bass player and maybe his other guitar players and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I you, you know, you work with the tech, and you're not sure what what they're doing for the uh, artist. And MJ probably would know more than I would. No, that's okay. Here's, a, here's about it. You know, I've got another question for you. Um, and just so you know, um, Seymour, we're running on about two hours. So um, you let me know when you're when you're ready to hang it up. I'm, okay. Yeah, maybe five more minutes or something. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, well, that'd be fine. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds great. Um, so George Russell has a question for you about uh, the perpetual burn pickups. Those are burn Jason pickups? Becker, the Jason Becker pickups. I guess the perpetual yeah, burn. Jason Beckers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, did those, we did those back in 1990. The first colors pickups that I did. Yeah, uh, the, yeah, that was early. Yes, yeah, that was early back in 1990. He was using a regular STKS to be on mm -hmm. the center. And then he was using an SH5. Um, it was a TB5 on the bridge, and I think a 59 on the neck. 
and there were special colors that we, you know, would color for him, you know, and, um, and later on when the new design of the guitar came out, they changed a little bit about the stack and now they're using the stack plus, but that's the original pickup. I still have all the notes. I can still make them. And like Seymour says, <laughs> treat John Smith from down the corner like if he was Eddie Van Halen, because you never know if, if he will be the next Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, great. like I said, there's so many great guitar players out there. And, Amazing. And we get, yep. we get sent videos all the time of what these guys are doing. And I think it's so cool, you know, that these kids are proud of what they're doing. They have a right to be, you know, and they got a new guitar, man. They got new pickups in it or a new amplifier. And they just want to get out there and show their buddies what they've learned. You know, I remember I used to call my friend, uh, you know, Joe Seddon in uh, Vineland, New Jersey, Pittman area. And uh, I would play over the telephone. Look, I can play a harmonic. You know, I could do like Roy Buchanan does, you know. And I would play this stuff for him, you know. And, and over the years, he was such an um, important part of my life growing up. I had no, really nobody to talk to. There weren't many guitar players where I lived, you know. So when I would meet somebody, and I used to ride my bike to a club and just stand outside and wait for the door to open so I could look in there with all the red, <laughs> blue, and green lights and see what kind of guitars they had and everything. So for me, I, I still remember that like it was yesterday, you know, and, and I, you know, I wish, hope these kids go out there and do the same thing. You know, if you can't get in to see a band, just go try to listen to them, you know, and find out what they're doing. So it's pretty yep. cool. You know? Check out some local music as well. Oh, oh man, special. it's so important. Yeah. Support your local music. Yeah, definitely. Totally, totally. You know what? I'll give you one last question because um, I know you, uh, you know, we're running long on time here. So uh, Jim, Jim Nicholas has a question. Um, what is the most sold Seymour Duncan pickup? The most what? The most sold pickup. Oh, JB. The JB. Oh. Yeah, JB. I mean, got probably hundreds of thousands of them, you know. And, uh, and then next from that would be the 59 probably or? Yeah, probably. The jazz, jazz model. model. Jazz yeah. 59 the jazz model, yes. 59 jazz model, yeah. But, um, you know, I like I like doing traditional stuff all the time, yeah. And and we still do a lot of rewinding here in the custom shop. People send us their old PAFs. And, and you know, what's really cool is uh, I have all the original tape that Gibson used before the company went out. Of, they stopped selling it, you know. And, hmm. um, so I have the old, it's called number four flatback tape, which you can't find anymore. And to, to me, it's, it's, I have boxes of it. I mean, I, I bought rolls and rolls and had them cut it for me and everything. And here's, here's this old tape here. There's a little, huh. little piece of it. And, uh, yeah, yeah, we have, some of the green wire from old T tops too. Or? Oh yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We got, we got hundreds of different grades, magnet wire and tellers. And yeah, you know, it's like, it's pretty cool, you know? And, and, uh, so it's, it's pretty, we got, it's a lot that's, going on here. It's historical. Stuff. It's historical. Yeah. yeah this what's that? What's that old. machine behind? What's that machine behind you? By the right next to MJ, right there. Uh, that one. It's 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 a winding machine. Oh, okay. Yeah. My but, hand but, winder. But, I, it's, right. it's very... Oh, did we lose them? Oh, Sorry, we'll get him back. There we go. Sorry. But okay. Right, <laughs> we, have, we have. I mean, another winding machine. That this is the one that we use the most. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Trying to get you back with Seymour. Okay, no problem. Oh, there, there there you go. Go. All right, cool. No, this is great. You guys have been fantastic. Um, and Seymour, you know, I want to mention before you go, uh, you sent me some links not only about uh, your music that you do. You do a, you know, you you, you play music, right. still live music. Uh, you also uh, look like you you still make arrowheads, so, right, so you yeah. still have you know your own hobbies outside of, uh, of the pickups. You know, I don't right. know if you want to just quickly talk about that or if you wanted to just say anything about that. Well, I know you have, is, like, when uh, I would go on the road with the reps and everything, I would uh, meet friends in different areas that would pick me up at the hotel, like Danny Gatton, and we go out and uh, find a hot spot looking for arrowheads and everything, and then. Uh, I was with one of my reps, uh, and we were in Oklahoma. And uh, funny story is, uh, 
we were, I think in St. Louis, he, he took me to um, uh, meet this guy who's going to take me to this rock quarry where the Indians actually got uh, their, their materials and everything for making arrowheads. And the fun thing is it was like foggy, you know, it looked like a, a Sherlock Holmes kind of movie, you know, it was all foggy and misty. It was like six o'clock in the morning. Sun was just barely coming up. And uh, so we walked down to the, to this ravine and the stream we had to cross and uh, to go back to where this uh, material was, this uh, certain kind of chert I was looking for. So we get back there and, and Danny, I forget his last name. I said, Danny, don't step on the green moss. And he said, why? And I said, because it's slippery. And he was in shorts. Mm -hmm. So he steps in on this rock that had green moss on it. And he went <sighs> sliding down like a seal into this, you know, four foot deep puddle of water. I mean, it was like part of the stream. And he comes up and his shin's all bloody and all red and everything. And he's bleeding. Mm. And I said, Dan, you better go put something on that. You know, and he says, well, let me go back to the store. And uh, so he, he goes back, but he leaves the shoes on the side of the road that were full of blood. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we come out like an hour and a half later. And there's like a bunch of sheriff department, all these cop cars all around here. So somebody thought there was a hit and they took the body and they threw it back in the woods and, and they left his bloody shoes on the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, the driver, my friend Jim, he says, man, he says, we were just here looking for rocks and everything. He says, well, what, what's this boy? Yeah, he kept calling him boy. And uh, I said, we were looking for you know some stone to make arrowheads. And he looked, I swear to God, he looked at me and says, boy, Indians made arrowheads, not white boys. You know, he, <laughs> he, just, he just said that to him. And I said, yeah. oh. So I, I, I left and I sat down on the ground. I made the quickest white boy arrowhead you could imagine, man. I made like a four <laughs> foot little knife blade, you know. Right. And I brought it back. I said, Officer, here's the white man's arrowhead, you know. And he says, He just looked at it and shook his head. And there was a lady, there was, I swear to God, the hillside had like 20 people up on the hillside. And this one little, can I uh, say something, please? I'm, I'm a local librarian in town here. And, uh, but what he's saying is very correct about this used to be an Indian quarry and the Indian used to get their rock back, back in the fields back there. <laughs> and uh, so finally they let us go. And then they, Jim got me to the airport and I flew back to Santa Barbara, but we thought we were going to get uh, thrown in jail or something. For, but then as we were getting ready to leave, Danny comes up uh, who is the guy who cut it. His leg was all bandaged up and everything. And he says, Oh man, I'm sorry. I left my shoes on the side of the road. I didn't want to get my car wet. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah. he, put, he put plastic shopping bags around his uh, leg so it wouldn't drip on the floor, you know. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's funny, funny stories like that, you know. It's pretty, pretty amazing. You know? That's awesome. Well, hey, I, I can't thank you enough, Seymour, for coming on the show. Seymour Duncan. Everybody go to SeymourDuncan.com. Um, check out their pickups. Check out their products, uh, their uh, pedals. A uh, whole bunch yeah, of stuff. stuff going on. You guys got to have now, a whole... Um, can we give you MJ's email in case anybody wants uh, information or has more questions? Yeah, absolutely. Can answer at a later date. We can. I can text them back or whatever. Please do, yeah. Yeah, it's just... Uh, it's only MJ at SeymourDuncan.com. MJ at SeymourDuncan.com. All right, All right, thank you, MJ. Yes, MJ, thank you. You've been a pleasure to work with also getting this all set up for us. We appreciate it. Uh, yeah, you guys thank are you guys out there too. Everybody listening, it's pretty late for some of you guys back east. But yeah, it's it. late. We still have 204 people watching, so it's uh, we got oh, a great, great crowd. Of, we got well, a great crowd. Of, I really appreciate it. Yeah. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for coming on, Seymour. Thank you, and uh, yeah. I hope we, we had fun. That was a great time. Thank you so much. Thank you. I got to come up and visit you sometime. Please do. Yeah, you yeah, love it. I'd love to. Okay, see you guys. That'd be Thank awesome. You. Bye -bye. All right, you got have a great night, guys. Thank you. See you. See you. Goodbye. Bye. Have Bye. a great weekend. And uh, next guest will be announced soon. You guys have a great weekend. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.